Hey Donovan, I recently found out a shocking secret about our government, and I've been wrestling what to do with that information. At first, I decided to keep quiet because I don't want to be on the radar, but it's been weighing on my conscience. I think everyone needs to hear this. My father was career military, and he was hardly ever home when I was growing up. As a result of this, I never really felt close to him. When he was home, he always had this stern look about him, and he would shut himself away in his study most of the day. Mom always told me not to bother him. He was trying to rest. So I grew up with my dad remaining kind of a mystery to me. I'm in my 50s now, and my mom's been gone for five years. Cancer. Since dad was all I had left, I tried to find some common ground in recent years, but things were always awkward between us. He didn't rebuff me. He was so quiet when I came over to visit. I would always wind up leaving sooner than I planned, feeling like I was crowding him. Things went downhill with his health eight and a half months ago. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and he didn't have much time left. I made more of an effort to be there, and he even opened up a little, telling me some stuff about his childhood that I never knew. Nothing important, but it was nice to have him talk to me like a normal dad, reminiscing about the past. I'm thankful we finally bonded a little before he passed 42 days ago. My dad made the decision to spend his final days at home. I took a leave of absence from work so I could be there with him at the end. He was on morphine and in and out of consciousness for three days. When he was lucid, he seemed really sharp. His eyes focused and his words seemed to be chosen carefully. What I mean to say is, the things he decided to tell me during this period were not ramblings of a man on drugs. He told me there were things he had done in his life that he needed to get off his chest. Things he wanted me to know about before it was too late. My dad told me he had been part of a secret government branch known as the 4E. The mission of this branch was to evaluate threats to US citizens from unknown entities, eradicate those threats, and employ any means necessary to erase the incidents. So 4E for Entity, Evaluate, Eradicate, and Erase. He said if citizens of this country knew what was living here among us, there would be mass anarchy, rebellion against the government, chaos, stock markets would crash, crime would surge, people's faith in God would take a toll. I disagree, by the way. But my dad said during his whole lifetime he stood by that philosophy, doing things to protect our country and our way of life. Here are some of the things that he said have happened. There's an underground base in Colorado that has several alien beings who were taken alive from a UFO crash site in 1986. The government is trying to find a way to communicate with them. They are also testing their resistance to diseases that are global concerns. Dad said that he had seen one of the aliens himself, which was kept drugged and locked in a lab. He described it as looking just like all those pictures you see, grayish and short, skinny arms and legs oval head and big eyes. He told me they had to keep creatures dosed up with something because they have mental abilities to manipulate solid structure, but he didn't elaborate on that. Dad also said the government is aware of creatures that are hiding in the national forest. He told me it's assumed that they have been there since the beginning of time, and although over 6,000 have been eradicated between 1948 and 1995, the population is still thought to be pretty high upwards of 10,000. Okay, that to me was just staggering. He said he had been called in several times to strong arm park rangers, who indicated they wanted to make the public aware of these creatures. He personally had to threaten several park officials with losing their jobs, and also had to imply that they would be prosecuted for treason if they went ahead and told. I think dad felt bad about that part, because he went on about it a bit, threatening the rangers I mean. The last thing he told me was, there was a creature that had escaped from a government lab in the 60s and adapted to life in the swamps and the sewers. He described it to me. It sounded like one of those rake things people talk about. Humanoid, very pale, skittering around on all fours, big head, black eyes, and no nose. It moves very fast. He said one of the main concerns of 4E was that it preyed on human flesh. Apparently one had killed and partially eaten one of the doctors studying it when it escaped, so the population breeding in the wild was thought to be a real threat to mankind. I was totally shocked to hear all this stuff, 
But I tell you, looking straight into his eyes, I know he was relaying the truth. He was totally lucid. Dad was afraid to say anything until he was on his deathbed. But he was so worried about all these creatures as threats to human life. He didn't want me anywhere near the wilderness areas of the country, telling me it was unsafe. He said that there are thousands of disappearances in the national parks that are hushed up when the 4E comes in and deems one of these creatures responsible. If a body is found, the story leaks before they can cover it up. They say it was a bear or mountain lion. But if it's just a disappearance and they think it was one of these creatures, they cover it up. The story never gets publicized. So I hope I'm doing the right thing. I know my dad wrestled with the right and wrong of telling. But lately, all I can think is, the truth is always the right way to go. May he rest in peace. I live in a very suburban neighborhood in northern Michigan. It's just like any other neighborhood, really. We had just chosen the house because it's on a cul-de-sac, and it was safe for the kids to play outside. The rear of the house backs up to a natural open space area, which was another plus for us, so we could take the kids out on nature walks. What we didn't know when we moved in was that our neighbor to the west of us seemed a little deranged. He was very paranoid all of the time. He had an abnormal number of motion sensor lights on his house, and his window blinds always seemed to be closed. He even had his strand of barbed wire along the top of his backyard fence. The first time I met him, he was outside putting salt around his house. He was lugging around a 10 pound bag of coarse salt. We had barely introduced ourselves, and he was trying to give me some salt too. He said you never knew when the horned beast would come back. I thought then that maybe he was some kind of religious fanatic and was talking about the devil. But he said that he had noticed its footprints in his backyard last time it snowed, and that was when he had put up the barbed wire. So it sounded like he was talking about a physical beast. I tried to ask him some questions, but he said it wasn't good to talk about it too much. I don't like to judge, but I figured he had lost a few marbles. I know that some of my own relatives have gotten a little weird when they got cooped up alone for too long. One evening, I was in the kitchen, cooking and doing dishes, when I heard a low rumbling sound. I turned around and saw my 60 pound bull terrier facing the door to the backyard growling like i never seen him do. His hackles were fully raised and his body was rigid and shaking. His lips were curled and he was baring all of his teeth. He was taking in these big breaths and snarling. I had never seen him like that before. I had seen him bark and growl to neighborhood cats, but nothing like this. He's mostly muscle and he looked really intimidating. I was thinking, what in the hell is out there? I was home alone, so there shouldn't have been anybody out there. I grabbed a big kitchen knife and I opened the door a bit. When the door was open about halfway, I was hit with this horrible rotting meat smell. My mind was scrambling for a reason. I started thinking, did the lids get blown off the garbage cans? But no way would the garbage cans ever smell that bad. And I hadn't put anything in them like that. It was truly a putrid smell. I figured I better go out there and check it out. If some animal had gotten stuck in my yard, I didn't want it tearing anything up. My poor dog needed to calm down. It was around dusk, so I could still see out there a little, but it was verging on dark. I poked my head out the door and I heard a rustling sound and the sound of branches breaking. I looked towards the back fence and I thought I saw antlers. We had a lot of deer in the area and they would often be out at dusk, so I didn't think anything was unusual. The rustling noise kept going, so I was wondering if maybe it had gotten its antlers stuck in the fence. I didn't feel capable of releasing a trapped deer, but I couldn't just ignore it, especially with my dog going nuts, which was weird because he was used to seeing deer all the time. I wanted to get a closer look before I called animal rescue in case I was wrong. I managed to squeeze out the door without letting the dog out, but when I got out there, the dog went even more ballistic. He was actually jumping up and clawing at the door, like he was trying to tear it down. That should have clued me in, because my dog does not act like that. He's a big lovable goof. My backyard slopes up to the back fence, which is about 60 feet from the back door. So I started walking up there, and when I got within 20 feet, I just stopped dead in my tracks. There were definitely antlers, but it was not a deer. 
This antler head turned towards me and looked at me with these horrible yellow eyes. The eyes were like glowing out of these hollow sockets and the head looked like some kind of skull. It looked like it had the legs of a deer but it was standing upright and it was at least seven or eight feet tall. It was so skinny and looked so unreal but I'm telling you, it was real. Looking at it, I felt icy cold even though it wasn't that cold outside. While it was looking at me, I just felt hollowed out somehow, hopeless. I managed to turn around and run back to the house. I got in the door and I had to use all my strength to hold my dog back and slam the door and lock it. I just fell to the ground and held on to my dog. He was still lunging and barking his head off, but I just held on to him really tight. After about five minutes, he finally calmed down. I turned on the backyard floodlights and looked out there through my window. It seemed to be gone. I couldn't even think. There was no reference in my brain for such a thing. Do you have any idea what this is? Hey there, Donovan. I know your inbox must be flooded with stories, but this one might just be a bit different than the rest. That's because I've been tracking these ships now for some time, and I'm positive that I've been studying an alien species. This may sound insane, and my family definitely thinks so, but I have a great deal of evidence compiled that could sway even the most ardent non-believer. I'm based in New Mexico, near the border to Mexico. I will not share exact details, but can describe the general location. It's not a highly populated area, and there's not much out there except for the highway and a few rest stops. I have a day job which I will not reveal, but, but I do my main investigations at night. You see, the weather here is hot and dry, so it's a lot easier to canvas the area when the sun's not out. Otherwise, you end up with a mean sunburn and possible dehydration. I've been plotting the flight patterns of two spacecrafts. The first is a square-shaped hovered craft that flies pretty close to the ground. It ducks in and out and can do flips and turns. You may have thought at first that it was a drone, but there are no governmental nor recreation drones that have the capability to vanish into thin air. That's just what it does. It will fly around the desert and near my home base and eventually pick up speed. It'll flash a bright neon blue light and then disappear. It always starts off in the same area and I've followed it for up to a mile. At 3 a.m. it always vanishes, although sometimes it will blink away earlier than that. If I'm not able to keep up on my car or on foot, I can sometimes lose it, but usually it moves at quite a slow pace. The second spacecraft is much larger and more difficult to consistently track. It's more of a traditional UFO. I try not to use that phrase as it's been so misconstrued by the media and the government but it looks more like the general public's idea of an alien ship. And you know what? There's clearly a reason so many people have seen these ships out here in New Mexico, Texas, and Nevada. It's because this flight path is strategically placed to connect to the gravitational pull with the equator. I can get into this theory more in private. The ship travels from the east to the west, and I've calculated it to be moving at around 15 miles per hour. Sometimes it will pause for a moment as a car passes by, or an animal walks through the area, but it typically continues at a steady pace. The ship flies in an altitude far lower than a plane, and creates this ripple effect behind it. There's no chemtrail or anything like that. There's only a ripple of heat or gravitational disturbance that follows in its wake. The first time I spotted it, I happened to be outside letting my pup use the facilities around 2 a.m. I looked overhead and I saw it. There is this ring of LED light illuminating the edges of this circular craft, but it is otherwise invisible. For the next few weeks, I would set my alarm clock to go off at 1.50 a.m. and then head outside. I can only speculate on whether these ships are friends or foes, but they are certainly interesting to study. The government bases nearby would surely be able to notice these ships on their radar. So I am unsure why there have been no stories yet released about their presence. The first time I spotted the first ship, I created a post on Twitter and on Reddit. In less than a day, however, my accounts were banned. I will not be sharing any photos publicly. However, I do have a few photos that I could share with you. Everyone in Jersey's heard of the Jersey Devil. Well, I don't know about the young people 
These days, they don't seem to pay attention to anything unless it's online. Not me. I grew up in Hamilton, New Jersey, in the Pine Barrens, so I heard all about it when I was a kid. Hamilton is the blueberry capital of the world because there's lots of blueberries grown around it. When I was a kid, it was a pretty small town. My parents owned a diner that specialized in blueberry pancakes. Big surprise. They ran it together like a true mom and pop joint. As soon as I was big enough to stand on a stool to wash dishes, they put me to work. Later, I'd flip pancakes or wait tables. The old timers that hung around drinking coffee would sometimes talk about the Jersey Devil. They claimed that they heard it at night or seen it flying through the sky. Kids were always warned not to go in the forest because it might get them. Of course, we didn't listen. I had spent a good bit of time riding bikes on the dirt out there with other like-minded youngsters. We stayed out until dusk sometimes, but never saw any evidence of that thing. Once, an old man came into the diner with a grainy black and white photo. Everyone passed it around and took a look, but really, it just looked like a bird in the night sky. There was a moon, but not enough to light it up much. I didn't hear anything about the Jersey Devil for a long time after that. I kept working at the diner until I went into the army for a couple of years. I came back and mom and dad decided to retire. They took off for Florida and left me with the diner. I got married and my wife and I ran it together. My wife doesn't like to stay up late, so I usually close by myself. We don't get a lot of business at that time, so a lot of nights it's just me. There are a few regulars who come in at night, folks who work the late shift or just restless types. Then there's tourists or truckers on their way through town. I started to hear about sightings. Most people just heard a weird screeching, loud, late at night. A few saw something too, flying in the sky mostly. I didn't take it too seriously, but I thought it was interesting since I hadn't heard about it for such a long time. Maybe I thought it had been around when those old timers saw it, and it left for somewhere and then came back again. Maybe it went on to the other side of the Pine Barrens. This went on for maybe about a year, where every month or so, someone would come in with a story. One day, I closed the diner as usual. I went outside, and I heard a screech. It was so loud. It sounded like an airplane, if an airplane was a hawk or some kind of angry bird. I looked around, but I didn't see anything except the quiet, empty street. Things pretty much shut down in Hamilton by 8 o'clock. We stay open till 11, but not much else does except for the bar down the street. I thought about asking the bartender if he heard anything. Jack, who's usually the only one there at night, is pretty hard of hearing. I thought it was worth a try, though, or maybe I just wanted a drink. So I walked over and ordered one. Since it was a Tuesday night, no one was there except for a couple swaying together on the small dance floor near the jukebox. I doubted they heard anything over the crooning of Frank Sinatra. I asked Jack if he heard a screech. A what, he says? So I asked him if he's heard anything about the Jersey Devil lately. A few stories, he says. Don't put no stock in them. I asked him for an example. He says, you know, people see stuff in the sky. Weird screaming noises. Going back to my car, I wasn't sure what to think. On one hand, Jack didn't believe there was anything to worry about. But on the other, he was hearing the same stories as me. So that wasn't good. Two nights later, I was inside the diner mopping when I heard it. This time, I went out to the back door. It sounded like a screaming freight train barreling down the street. I can't believe that other people didn't hear that thing. Maybe they explained it away somehow. Maybe they thought it was a train. I don't know. But I looked up into the sky and I saw something that looked like a flying dragon from a movie. Its wingspan was bigger than any bird or hawk that I'd ever seen. The sound started up again and I thought I should go back inside, but I wanted to see what would happen. It headed towards the woods and finally swooped down out of sight behind some of those tall pines. I heard it one final time and then I did go back inside. The next day I asked a few people if they heard it, including my wife. They all looked kind of nervous. I think they knew what it was, but nobody wanted to admit it. I heard it a few more times since then, and I tried to get a picture, but I haven't been able to yet. Hey there, Donovan. I've been a big fan of your channel for a while now, and I've always been curious about creatures that are hiding in this world. 
I have my suspicions of this very large dog creature here in Somerset, Maine, but it wasn't until recently that I actually saw it. I live out on a farm on a few acres of land, and my only neighbors are to the northeast about a mile down the road. It's pretty desolate out here, and there's not much to do except for hike, hunt, and fish. On this particular day, I decided to go fishing out at the riverbank. I was only out there for like an hour, when all of a sudden I heard this howling. Now, coyotes usually howl out here, but they have more of a high-pitched sound than whatever this thing was. The howl was low and guttural, and carried for like a full minute. Now, I'm sure I was the only one who heard it because I was really out in the middle of nowhere. It sounded pretty close. I figured it was better for me to be on the move than to come face to face with it. So I started to pack up my equipment and be on my way back to the house. As I was walking, I kept hearing it, and it was getting really loud now. I thought to myself that maybe it was a loose dog and followed me to get some food. But even the largest of dogs don't howl like that. There's just no way. I started picking up the pace, and when I got into the house, I slammed the door behind me. My walls are pretty thin, but I didn't really hear any more howling after that, so I figured I'd just clean my fish and start on dinner. I was laughing to myself and frying some oil as the sun started to set. I had my meal and then I sat down with my book and my lazy boy. I was starting to doze off when I suddenly hear a growling sound from outside. I put my book down and looked over at the window. The lights were on the porch so I could see, clear as day, this beast staring back at me through the screen door from the steps. The only thing between me and this creature was a thin sheet of mesh as I left the door open to allow a breeze to come in. I was terrified and tried to stay as still as possible. At this point, it was on all fours, and it looked just like a massive wolf. I could see its dark gray black hair standing up in these spiky tufts on its back, and its head was dipped low. I shifted my way to my seat and the thing started to stand up. The porch has only two steps and it crept up them. It moved itself on the two legs. The thing had to be over eight feet tall and its head was a huge mass of fur with this long snout. My eyes were glued on its row of huge teeth and I held my breath as it continued to move closer and closer. It looked into both of my two porch windows, first the left and then the right before centering itself back at the front door. It just sat there like a Doberman waiting for supper, and it sniffed a deep breath right at the mesh door. As it pulled its nose away, a drop of drool was left on the wire. I couldn't believe my eyes. If it wanted to, it certainly could have scratched and broken right through the door. Even if the door was closed, those powerful claws could have certainly done damage on the wood frame. I just sat there though. Damn, I do think I was lucky because who knows what would have happened if I tried to run or fight it. I think my freeze instinct certainly kicked in, and I just waited it out. Eventually, a white-tailed deer started across the lawn. I could see about 20 feet away, and I definitely spotted it before the wolf thing. But as it walked by, the wolf lifted its head and snout into the air, and took a whiff of the air. In an instant, it raised up onto its hind legs and jumped into the air. I heard a squeal from the deer, and the sound of gnashing and gnawing. I quickly grabbed a poker from the fireplace and armed myself. When I looked back outside, however, the creature and the deer were gone, leaving just a puddle of blood on the lawn. I definitely couldn't sleep that night, and for the next few days, I stayed over at my brother's house. I'm really terrified to go back to my farm. That thing is definitely out there, and I worry that next time, I won't be so lucky. I certainly would have ended up like that doe, I hope I never see that thing again, but if I ever go missing, I just want the world to know that it was this wolf creature out here. Hey Donovan, I wasn't always a believer in the paranormal, but my family and I unknowingly moved into a haunted house. The experiences I had there changed my perspective forever. It is easy to say there is no such thing as ghosts because it's nearly impossible to prove that they are. But once you experience it directly, there's no denying it. Not only did I feel the presence of a ghost, but I also feel threatened and violated by it. I always thought people were making up stories when they talked about their experiences. But now, I'm passionate about the paranormal, 
There's no way I could tell you everything that happened in that house, but there are a couple of things that I feel compelled to share with you, and maybe your audience as well. Spirits are not to be antagonized and messed with. We need to treat them with respect. We need to learn how to live amongst them instead of denying their existence. When we first moved into this house, we all thought it was perfect. It was big enough so every child could have their own room. The kitchen was enormous and the views were spectacular. It was right by the harbor and you could see hundreds of boats of all types traveling through. They were beautiful ocean views as far as you could see. And I'll never forget the smell of seawater you got when you cracked the window open. It seemed too good to be true at first. My room was massive and it had the most intricate carvings in the wood all around the room. The first week we stayed there, we didn't have beds or anything, but I didn't care. I was just so happy to finally have my own room. Slowly but surely, we started moving furniture and it started to feel like our home. Some of my fondest memories are from the first month we lived in that amazing house. One night, my brother and I were playing and we knocked over an old mirror off the wall and it shattered all over the floor. My mom scolded us and made us go to our rooms for the rest of the night. I could hear my brother running up and down the hallway, and I just knew my mom was going to freak out at both of us, and I was going to get in trouble for his behavior. I timed him so his footsteps were right outside my door, and I swung it open to smack him. I looked out into the hallway, and there wasn't anybody there. Convinced that my brother must have run into his room, I ran to his door and swung it open. I found him fast asleep, snoring in bed. Then I heard the footsteps again, and when I looked, there was nobody. I remember my hair stood on end, and it freaked me out. I went to bed and tried to just forget about it. That night, I woke up to this dark figure leaning over me. I tried to scream, but I couldn't make a sound. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move, and felt hands on my chest holding me down. I tried as hard as possible to make a sound but I could only shake the bed. Finally, I was released and I screamed for my parents. They ran in to check on me and told me I was having a bad dream. I told them it wasn't a dream and this dark figure was forcing me to stay on the bed. They told me there was no such thing as ghosts or spirits. They assured me it was just a bad dream and encouraged me to go back to sleep. I stayed awake the whole night staring at the foot of the bed. Shortly after that, I heard my mom and dad fighting over who was leaving the tub running. They both claimed not to use the tub and to only use the shower. This became a common argument and soon, every child in the family was getting blamed for leaving the tub running. My dad got so mad one night that he shut the water to the tub off. A couple minutes afterwards, all of us were in the bathroom arguing about who the guilty one was when the faucet turned on completely by itself. We were all terrified. My mom asked, who's there? The sink faucet was immediately turned on and the lights in the bathroom were turned off. We all screamed and ran out of there. A little after that, it was my birthday. We were celebrating with cake. My mom told me to make a wish and then blow out all the candles. I made a wish and took a deep breath. And before I could blow them out, all the candles on the cake went out. And these old candles on the mantelpiece immediately lit up. We all just sat there scared looking at the candles for a while. Then my dad threw the candles away and we ate the cake and we tried to pretend nothing happened. One night I woke up to my dad screaming. We all ran into the room and dad was shaking. We asked him what was wrong and he wouldn't tell any of us for a while. Finally, he said that he went into the bathroom and the apparition of a woman was in the bathtub seductively calling to him. I told him that I thought there was no such thing as ghosts. My dad said, we're leaving this place immediately and we did. Later, we looked up the house and it turned out that a man who lived there previously killed his seven-month pregnant wife by drowning her in the bathtub and then shot himself in the head. It made the local papers. We were all shocked. Pictures would fall off the wall and cabinets and would be left open almost daily. Doors would open and close on their own and you could hear footsteps, voices, and music throughout the house at different times of the day. One day, I'd like to compile a list of all my family's experiences there, as well as the experiences of other people who live there. It was crazy, and being in that place would turn anyone into a believer. I work at the Taco Bell on West Country Road in Merrill, Wisconsin. 
And just like they say, we're open late. So I'm like low guy on the totem pole there. And I always get stuck closing up with this guy who's lazy as all get out. But you know, I gotta keep this job. So whatever, if he doesn't do it, I gotta do it. And I'm not gonna complain to my manager and be known as a rat. No one likes a rat. I really wanted to get home that night because some days I've just had it, you know? And here it is after three in the morning and I'm still mopping up the floor while the other guy keeps going into the bathroom to avoid doing any work. So I grab the trash and haul it outside, even though I've done everything on my list. I got out to the dumpster, which is kind of in a shed with three sides, and I come around the corner and I see this thing scoot back behind the dumpster. I thought it might be a homeless guy or something, cause it's so late, so I just yelled, hey, By the way, I ain't got no problem with anyone living in the street, but he needed to get out of there. Nobody answers me, so I stop because I've got to unlock the padlock, and I can't see who's back there. For all I know, it's someone who's going to mug me. I didn't know what to do, so I just yelled, I'm calling the cops. And then I hear a growl, really loud and mean sounding, and I'm like, what? Because I thought I saw a person walk behind there. But maybe I was wrong, because now it sounds like a big dog, that low growl that they have. So I did something kind of stupid then. I just picked up a rock and threw it at the dumpster, thinking the noise on the metal would scare it off. But instead, this thing rushes straight out at me and sweet Jesus, I've never seen nothing like that before. It was on two legs like a man and bigger than me, but it looked like a dog's head on it with a muzzle and everything and I could see teeth because it was snarling. I just dropped the bag of trash and ran for the door because my mind couldn't understand what that thing was, but I still knew it was gonna eat me. I got to the door and that loser Stan had locked the frickin' lock because you know that's the policy here after hours. You lock it even if you're going out for just a minute. So I got the key in my hand, but I'm shaking so bad I can't get it in the lock and I can't see Stan anywhere. I looked over my shoulder and thank god that thing must have gone after the trash bag instead because it's not behind me. I managed to get the key in the lock and got inside and locked it. I'm breathing so hard I thought I'd had a heart attack. I told Stan there was this weird creature like a werewolf out there and he laughed at me. Of course. I guess I would have laughed if he told me that, but I can tell you right now this thing was real. It was covered in dog fur or wolf fur and it had a big head like a dog and stand-up ears. I didn't get a good look at its paws, but its eyes were yellow and it had these big teeth. It was definitely walking on two legs because it came at me that way. I don't know about a tail. We left like 15 minutes later, but I wasn't parked near the dumpster, so I just hurried over to my car and got in and locked the doors. I cruised by on the road to the other side where you can see the dumpster, but the thing was gone, or hiding behind it maybe. I even told my manager about it, because I don't want to work the closing shift anymore, and he thought I was making this up. So the only thing that I can think to do is maybe go over there some night when I'm not working and sit in my car facing that dumpster with my camera ready. I figured I need a picture for anyone to take me serious, and who knows, I might even be able to sell a picture like that to a magazine or something. So stay tuned, because you'll be the first to know, Donovan, when I get a picture of that thing. Thanks for all your help getting these stories out there, man. I think you're a real stand-up guy. Hello, Donovan. I know you tell a lot of crazy paranormal stories on your channel, so I figured I would send this for you to read so I can get some sort of idea of what is going on with this dude named Larry. I worked at a coffee shop for a while, and it was a pretty chill job. You got to meet all kinds of people and most of them were excited to get their coffee. It was a 9 to 5 type of job. And I had all sorts of jobs with crazy hours. So the normalcy was refreshing. Every single day for the past year, our first customer was this man named Larry. He was always in a rush and always got black coffee. Occasionally I could get some pleasantries out of him. But most of the time, he just stared bloody daggers at me until I got him his coffee. It got to the point where we would open about five minutes early and have his coffee ready for him, so we could just hand it through the window. He would often grab the coffee, pay, and leave without saying a word. He was a very strange individual, but he always made me laugh. He wasn't the biggest fan of human interaction, 
but he sure did love his coffee. He always had a very serious and wide-eyed expression on his face, and I never saw him smile. Then one day, he just stopped showing up. I would still open the shop about five minutes early out of habit, but he stopped coming altogether. I began wondering what happened to him. Did he move? Did he start getting his coffee from somewhere else? Did I somehow offend him? After about a week, I started looking into it a little bit. All I knew was his first name, Larry, but I was determined to figure out what happened. He wasn't the biggest talker, but I knew if I could just talk to him, he would let me know why he stopped coming. I searched Larry and filtered for our city on Google, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I couldn't find anything at all. I eventually just figured he had moved and tried not to think about it. About a month went by and I saw Larry's black car coming through the drive through again. It was much later in the day than I usually saw him, and he had this smile on his face, something I never thought I'd see. I was excited to see him even though we'd barely spoken before. I asked him if he wanted his usual, and he asked what his usual was. I kind of laughed because the man ordered the same thing at the same time for an entire year. I told him that he always got a large dark roast coffee, and he said he'd like a green tea. I sort of joked with him that he was switching it up a little bit, and he laughed and laughed. His laugh seriously disturbed me. My joke wasn't that funny, and he had tears streaming down his face and a deep bellowing laughter. He kept laughing harder and harder, and he stared directly into my eyes the whole time. I nervously laughed along, but something wasn't right. This wasn't the Larry that I knew at this point. His laughter and his face had me fearing for my safety. I politely waved him on and closed the window, but he stayed by the window leaning towards me. He was laughing so hard that he was spitting all over the window. His eyes looked different. I couldn't see the white in his eyes at all anymore, and I wondered if he was having a stroke or something. I picked up the phone to call the police when he just sped off. It was seriously disturbing. My co-workers all asked what the hell was wrong with Larry, but when I told them what had happened, they just kind of laughed it off, but I was freaked out. I finished my shift and headed to the grocery store to get something to cook for dinner. When I got out of the store, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a black car. I really didn't want to believe it was Larry's car, so I just got my car and headed home. Sure enough, the black car pulled up right behind me and started following me. I looked in the rearview mirror and it was Larry with his black eyes and a huge creepy smile. I was seriously freaked out and I just sort of pretended not to see him and kept driving down the road. Every turn I took, he closely followed. I eventually started driving randomly and erratically to see if he kept following me. Without hesitation, he closely followed every turn I made. I eventually called the police and told them that a regular customer of mine was now stalking me. He seemed incredibly dangerous. They asked me what my car looked like and told me to drive straight to the police station. I did as they asked and as soon as I pulled into the station, Larry took off down the road. I thanked the officers and they told me I couldn't get a restraining order against him unless I had some undeniable evidence that he was stalking me. I felt helpless but I figured the worst was over and I headed home. Waiting in the parking lot of my apartment building was Larry in his black car with a terrifying smile on his face. His mouth was huge and his eyes were pitch black. I drove by and I went to sleep at my parents' house that night. The next morning at work, I was freaked out that he might be there to get his coffee or green tea, but I didn't see him. I was incredibly relieved and I went on as if nothing had happened. When I got to my apartment, there were hundreds of completely full cups of coffee from the shop that surrounded my bed. It was as if he saved every single cup he had brought for me and not had a single sip from any of them. I had my parents help me move out of there immediately, and I quit my job at the coffee shop. The only thing that I can figure is that Larry is possessed. His facial expression, his behavior, and his eyes all look like that. I do admit, though, that this is not my area of expertise. Do you have any idea what I'm dealing with here? I haven't had any experiences with him since, but I'm living in constant fear that I might see him again. Hey Donovan, I really like your show and I've been meaning to share this with you for a while, but I used to own a campground near Grand Lake, Colorado. Grand Lake's a glacier lake, so it's cold. 
You can't really swim in it, even in the summer. But tourists come to go on boat rides around it because it's very scenic. So my campground was just outside of town on a dirt road. We had 30 RV hookups, 10 campsites for tents and 11 cabins. Also showers, laundry room and an office. I lived in a little apartment above the laundry and it was great really. I hired a few people to help out like townies and a few transient types who headed down south for the ski resorts for winter to work. But then, one day, this guy comes into the office with a photo on his phone. He was staying at the farthest RV spot from the office. I can't remember, but he had some kind of camper trailer, maybe even a pop-up. He was staying in with his girlfriend. He looked to be in his 60s. I figured he was retired, but I didn't think about it too much. Lots of people come and go and mostly don't stay for more than a week. This guy had been there a couple days, I think. I've been working on payroll for the week, worrying as usual about whether I had too many people on staff and how I was going to make it through the winter. From November to April I catch a few odd jobs in town, like driving one of the country snow plows, but it's never easy. When this guy walked in, I felt a cold breeze. Maybe not a breeze, more like a little freeze in my gut. It made no sense because when he checked in, the guy was friendly enough, talking about the weather, hiking, and photography. That was his hobby. I figured he just wanted to complain that the washer ate his quarters, something like that. So I smiled and said hi and he said, I got something to show you. He had a laptop computer under his arm and he put it on the counter and opened it up and this photo filled the screen. It was dark. I had no idea what I was looking at. You see those red eyes, he said. I looked closer and maybe saw two red dots off to the side of the blurry trees. I guess they were. Maybe, I said. Wish I could have got a better shot, he said. That there's a mothman. I'm sure of it. So he started to tell this story about how he got up early wanting to walk down to the overlook to get a photo of the sunrise. He heard something like huge wings flapping and turned around. Through the trees he saw this man-shaped thing. Only it had huge wings and no face. Like where the face should have been there was nothing except for these large red eyes. He grabbed the camera from around his neck and got off a shot at it, just before it flew into the sky. He wanted to try for another picture, but the sky was so dark that he knew he wouldn't get anything. Wish I'd thought I'd take a video, he said. The sound of those wings would have picked up on the mic for sure. I didn't really believe him. I never even heard of the Mothman before. I figured he'd just seen a hawk or something. Lots of them out there. The next day, he and his girlfriend took off, and I pretty much forgot about it. A couple weeks later though, things got weird. People would come and set up and leave the next day. They never said why, they just break their reservations and go. We were losing so much money that I was sure I'd never have enough for winter. The employees started quitting. Finally, after a couple weeks of this, I cornered Jimmy who runs the laundry in the shower rooms. He cleans, collects the quarters and fills the machines, all that stuff. They're scared of the Mothman, he said. Oh, come on, I said, Larry, that's crazy. He showed me a picture on his phone, but it just looked like grainy blackness. The photo, he said, was from Bob, who used to cut the grass at the campground. Bob quit the week before. I wasn't scared of this thing, but I was scared I'd never make any money off the place again. Then one couple came with a small tent, and I gave them the furthest campsite near the pond. On the day they were supposed to leave, Jimmy found all their things still there, but they were gone. We waited a day and they still hadn't returned. We called the county sheriff and he took all their stuff for evidence. No sign of them. Before we let anyone else have that site, I went out and looked at it. The sheriff guys had tromped all over it. But off near the woods, I saw some weird markings in the dirt. They were kind of line-like tracks, but claw-like sort of. I looked up what moss feet looked like, and they could have been big moth feet. I don't know, I wasn't really sure. Anyway, I was tired of not knowing what was going on, so one day I got up really early and went to the edge of the campground where it meets the woods and just stood there looking for a while. You know how your eyes take a while to get used to the dark? And when they do, you slowly start to see more. That happened, and then I saw something standing there at the edge of the woods. It was pretty far away, but I saw the red eyes. There was this huge loud flapping sound, and then this thing was gone. That's when I decided to sell the campground and move to Florida.
I've been a cop in a small town in West Virginia for a lot of years. Our population is only around 3,000 people. It's generally pretty quiet when you're patrolling a town that size. There are mostly just small shenanigans to deal with. One day, a report came in on a runaway teenager. I knew of the family, and this girl had run away a few times before. She was probably about 16 or 17 years old by then. She and her mother had a real troubled relationship. The father had moved out and gone to live in another state. The mother was quite a piece of work and was always tearing the girl down. I couldn't blame her for running away, really. Half the time when we got these reports, the truth ended up being that the mother had kicked the kid out of the house. I showed up one time on a disturbing the peace call, and I found the mother outside throwing rocks at the girl and screaming at her to leave. I know teenagers can be a handful, but I felt sorry for that girl. In a bigger city, if a kid that age runs away, you'll get one patrol car who gets the assignment to basically put out a description one time. At most, they'll go to a friend or two's house and see if they can find out anything. Then they'll file a report and enter the person as a wanted in the computer. There are so many runaways. The chances are pretty small that officers will have time to make it a priority. And a person that old is usually leaving home on their own free will, and it's not considered an emergency. But if found, the juvenile will be forcibly returned and the wanted status will be canceled. That's what kept happening to this girl. This time, the report said that she had gone off with some kid on a motorcycle. I had the luxury of spending the time it took to ask questions and run down the leads. A friend of hers said they had camping gear with them, and they had mentioned heading towards Sutton Lake. I was familiar with that area. My own family had spent a good amount of time camping and fishing there. Now that it was early summer, that would be a good place to hide out. I was personally invested in making sure this girl was okay. No one had any idea who the guy was that she was with, but it did sound like he was of similar age. If a girl runs off with an older guy, there are criminal charges he could face, like endangering the welfare of a minor. At around 8 p.m., I headed east on Interstate 79 and then turned off toward the Elk River Wildlife Area. Before you get to the lake, there's a small cemetery that you go by called Poplar Ridge. I was passing by there when I noticed a motorcycle parked near one of the buildings. I pulled in and shone my spotlight over the chain link fence, but I didn't see anybody. The bike was loaded down with saddlebags and a big duffel bag so it matched the description. I got out of the car to have a look around. There are big trees surrounding the cemetery and when I was walking around the perimeter, I noticed some flickering lights in the woods. I headed into the trees to check it out. I got closer and I could tell that something was shining a flashlight back and forth. Then I hear this piercing scream. Before I could move or do anything, something big and black came flying out of the woods. It passed in front of me about 20 feet away and flew toward the cemetery. Then more screams came from the woods. I was about to call out when two teenagers came out of the trees and ran towards me looking wild-eyed. They were breathing hard and gasping about a monster. I tried to get them to calm down and tell me what happened. They said they had seen something huge crouched on a branch about five feet off the ground and had shown their flashlight at it and they had caught sight of these big red eyes staring at them. That's when the girl had screamed and the thing had flown out of the trees. I wouldn't have believed him if I hadn't seen it myself, that thing flying past me. I turned around and ran back in the direction it had flown. I'm not in the habit of chasing monsters, but if you had seen how big this thing was, you'd understand why I was freaked out. I even have my gun drawn by now. I approached the chain link fence and looked over. I shone my flashlight on the gravestones, then I saw something perched on one of them. It was crouched on the stone and it looked like something that was half human and half bat. It turned its head towards me and I could see a face, but my light caught two reflective red eyes. It looked like some awful angel of death or something. I was pointing my gun at it and it spread its wings and whooshed off faster than you would think is possible. Me and the kids could only gape at the gravestone where it had been. We were just stunned into silence. Eventually, I came to my senses as I suspected. These were the kids I was looking for. We went back down to the patrol car and I made my report. I told the sergeant about the monster. 
but he said just to stick with the facts and not to mention it. I felt like that was wrong, but what could I do? I'm sure no one would believe it anyway. Hi Donovan, I wanted to start off by saying thanks for putting this together. It's nice to have a community where I won't feel crazy about bringing this stuff up. I've never really gotten into stories about strange happenings. But a few years back, when I was out in the Humboldt County area, something happened that made me a believer. I'm sure you and a lot of your listeners are aware that this is a pretty remote area of California. It's also beautiful, and a ton of people go missing there every year. I live in Nevada, but my cousin, who I've always been close with, lives in California. In 2012, I was headed to college, so we decided to do a bit of a road trip through Northern California before I had to live in the dorm. My cousin, I'm going to call him Todd for privacy reasons, is no stranger to the north part of the state. He's a bit of a daredevil and is always trying crazy risky sports and hobbies. I told him I wanted to keep this trip tame, which he was up for. We were going to do a drive up the famous 101, then hook over to 299. It cuts east through the state and there's a nice mountainy area I was excited about. At the time, my cousin was driving a really old Nissan. It actually had a hole that was starting to wear through the passenger side floor. And I had to keep my feet a certain way, so I didn't accidentally put my foot through the floor. This was in late summer and the weather was great. Further north, it cools down a bit. So we had the windows down and my cousin had an epic playlist on. The first few nights, we stayed in motels and bumped around towns like Eureka. We met up with two of Todd's friends around there and they joined us for the drive. At some point, the group of us started telling stories about odd things that had happened to us here and there. I didn't have much to contribute. Like I said, I've had a pretty tame life growing up. No weird experiences. But one of the girls who was with us, Catherine, seemed really into this stuff. She had a few different encounters, as she called them. At first, me, Todd, and the other friend kind of laughed and made fun of Catherine a bit. But after about an hour of chatting on this topic, it was obvious she was getting upset about us not believing her. The mood in the car had also changed, maybe just because it was coming on nighttime. We were on 299, but not too far along it. This was a stretch where it was really woodsy, and Todd spotted a pretty deep pull-off to the right, so we decided to camp out there. I go camping a few times a year and I love it, but that night, I was definitely on edge. I thought it was just Catherine's creepy stories. They had gotten weirder and weirder as she told them. I just tried to shrug it off. My cousin and I had shared one tent, and the two friends had actually brought hammocks. So they started up a fire to heat up some wood while we set up the tent. The night was pretty quiet and uneventful. This is where it gets a little weird. Even writing in, I feel really self-conscious about this part, but I think finally telling someone about it will help me get over it. Late the next morning, the other girl, I can't remember her name, mentioned that there was a waterfall nearby down this little dirt road. It was a popular hiking area and we decided to stop. There were a few other cars parked there so nothing felt out of the ordinary. I switched out my sneakers for boots. Everyone grabbed their bags and water and we started into the woods. It was a beautiful day but surprisingly dark under the trees. At first the hike was flat but soon it started going uphill. It made sense since we were heading for the waterfall. There were a few tight switchbacks and some of these opened up into a view. We could see mountains not too far from us and pockets where the woods dipped down. The fog was rising up out of those dips, which was one of my favorite parts of being in the mountains. About a half hour into the hike, we stepped out onto a switchback that was pretty bare. All four of us slowed down to take in the view. There was another slightly taller and rugged looking mountain directly across from us. It had some bald spots, rocky faces sticking out through the trees, and it was on one of those rock faces that we saw the figure. At first, Todd thought it was a bear and quietly pointed it out. But soon it was obvious from the way it was moving that this wasn't a bear. It was definitely a person. The girls backed off the trail a bit and I could tell that they were both uncomfortable. I joined them quickly because the figure across the way from us turned and it was definitely a person. A guy wearing a dark cloak. I don't know how else to explain it. Almost like a robe. I couldn't get a good look at his face. It was immediately a weird thing to see in the middle of the woods. 
and the fact that he looked like he was just waiting for something really freaked me out. Todd was standing near the edge of the switchback, basically holding his breath. I had this horrible feeling that something bad was going to happen if the guy turned and saw us. Luckily, right then, a family with a few young kids came trudging down the trail towards us. Todd had to get out of the way and it kind of reset the vibe. It was hard to smile and act normal. I almost wanted to point out that guy to them, but I glanced back that way and he was gone. We gave it a few minutes after the family passed and then we all agreed to head back down to the car. None of us wanted to be out in the woods with whatever that was. We made it back in record time, piled in and flew down 299. No way were we camping in those woods that night. Eventually, Catherine reluctantly started telling another story about something called the Dark Watchers. A few months later, I gave in and I looked them up. I think she might have been right. It definitely seems like what we saw. They're basically beings in the woods who watch travelers, which I guess we were that day. I think my gut had picked on something because according to the legends, they're relatively harmless unless you make eye contact with them. I'm not sure what happens then, but people disappear. That's not unusual for Humboldt County, but it makes me wonder how many of those missing people have encountered dark watchers. This is the first time I'm bringing it up to anybody. Only Todd and the girls know what we experienced that day. I guess I could have used it as a freshman icebreaker, but I would have immediately been the weird kid. As freaky as it was, it's good to know that that stuff is out there. I'm a lot more careful now and aware. Thanks again for listening and getting info like this out there. Hey Donovan, I'm writing in with a UFO story from upstate Maine, just south of New Brunswick, Canada. My home is almost on the border, so I'm about as far north as you can get. I spent a few years out of high school working on an oil rig, and once I had money saved up, I built a small cabin up here on almost 20 acres of land. It's the perfect, peaceful place I've always wanted, but definitely comes with some strange events. Most of these events can be attributed to day-to-day -day things, like neighbors who don't understand the boundary lines. It's not usually an issue as I own a few firearms and can be pretty intimidating when I want to. Having two cane corsos helps too. I have a few chickens and the dogs keep the coyotes and foxes off the property. This past spring, I had a UFO experience that I thought you might find interesting. I say UFO because that's the only option I've been able to come up with for what I've witnessed. I'll just get straight to it. I always take my dogs out before going to bed, and in early April, I brought them out back to do their thing. They're two big neutered males, so I have a six foot industrial fence that encloses about 700 feet of yard, so I don't have to worry about them getting out. I like to go out and stand on the porch with them just to keep an eye on things. And that's what I was doing at this time. It was pretty late and already dark, but I have floodlights out back, so the whole area was lit up to the tree line. My girlfriend was on her way over, and I was keeping an ear out. I live on a dirt road and it's easy to hear cars coming up my way. I was just enjoying the night and watching the dogs romp around when I saw something out of place over the trees. Like I said, this is pretty far north, so seeing lights isn't uncommon. A few times of year, you can actually see the northern lights from Maine, and it's pretty cool. But even as I was squinting to try to make out what I was looking at, I realized it wasn't really the season to see the Aurora Borealis. The dogs were completely ignorant of what was going on overhead and just sniffing around in the grass. I stared up at what looked like a foggy area spreading low on the horizon, just behind the treetops. It was hard to tell how large or small it was because I couldn't really place how far away it was. At first, it did look a little like the Northern Lights, but whenever I've seen them, they've been a bright blue or green. This was kind of a soupy gray color. I kept staring for a minute, trying to remember if there was an airport or something out that way. Definitely nothing like city lights that would flood the night sky. I was about to write it off just as a weird night and call the dogs in, when five lights in a perfect row suddenly blinked into existence. They were lined up perfectly horizontally. That seemed odd. I have heard of satellites or launch known objects showing up in the sky with this kind of lighting, but usually the local chatter gives me a heads up about this stuff. I pulled out my phone and I called my girlfriend. She answered and quickly said she was a few minutes away. 
Are you at a place that you can pull off? I asked. I could tell by the tone of her voice that she thought it was a strange question, but she agreed to pull off onto the side of the road and asked why. When she pulled over, I explained that I was seeing something weird in the sky, and I wanted to know if she could see it where she was. I heard her open her car door on the other end, a few seconds of silence, and then she confirmed that yeah, she could see it. We talked about what it might be for a moment when the light suddenly shifted. That is what made me absolutely sure it wasn't a satellite or some kind of mechanical object. It looked to be five completely separate components. The lights separated from one another in different directions that didn't look geometric or intentional. One on the far right shot off into the distance and disappeared. On the other end of the line I heard a car door shut again, and my girlfriend shakily said she was coming over. We hung up and I watched as the other two lights kind of drifted away in relatively the same direction. The dogs had quieted by now, and they were on the porch, definitely confused about why I was still standing there. I blinked and then all of a sudden, one light in particular had moved significantly closer. I couldn't quite tell what it was, but it was definitely bigger, and shrouded in that gray fog like like I'd seen first. It moved slowly over the trees, probably a few miles out. And at the same time, I heard my girlfriend pull the car into the driveway. She came around to the side of the house through the gate, quickly greeted the dogs and got up next to me. I pointed out the largest light. The others were all gone now. That was almost acting as if they were scoping out the area. Is that near anything? She asked. But neither of us could identify why it would be there. We watched it move out for a few minutes until it started receding again. And then, like the others, it just sort of dissipated. Both of us had trouble sleeping that night. I didn't necessarily get a malevolent feeling from it, but just knowing that UFOs are really out there makes me a little uncomfortable. It feels better to have a roof over my head. I don't always go out with the dogs these days, and while I appreciate the peace and quiet out there, it really makes you think about just how alone we are. I got a story from last fall in Chicago. I still don't really know what happened. I'm a commuter student over at the University of Illinois. I got a job with a local cleaning company, and I liked it because the schedule was pretty flexible. I'd have my shift during the night and my classes during the afternoon, and it was almost enough money to feel comfortable. I liked the company and I figured it was pretty steady work until I could find something else. Most of my assignments were for hotels and office buildings. Then a new apartment building opened up on the north side, and I got placed there. The first thing that happened, and this didn't make any sense, was that I needed both a security clearance and a physical before I could start to position. These were upscale condos, so the security thing I could understand. But the physical was really weird. I've worked for a couple other cleaning services, and they'd asked for some health questions, sure. But this time, I had to get a doctor's exam, and on my own dime. It was irritating, but I figured the bump in pay would be worth it. No one was allowed to move into the condos yet, so they were still in the process of showing the place off to potential residents. Me and a few other custodians were just supposed to make sure that nothing got too dusty. It was an easy enough gig. There were 60 apartments and only three of us, so the work still took all night. They had us cleaning there twice a week, sometimes more if there was an open house that day. After a couple of weeks, I noticed that I didn't feel as good as I used to. I had the sniffles and all my muscles felt really sore. Now, I was used to things bothering me and feeling a little under the weather. I had to work a lot with heavy duty chemicals and I was on my feet when I wasn't in class and normally I could just push through it. But this felt worse than usual. I figured it was the lead up to the flu, but I couldn't afford to call off from work. When I had my regular shift at the condos, I warned the other custodians to give me some space. Apparently, they had come down with something too. We all felt a little sick and didn't want to be there, but we were going to tough it out. Now, usually, I would take the middle floors. Regina would take the top and Jackson would take the bottom of the building. We didn't actually see each other much once our shift started, but that night, I needed a refill of bleach, so I headed down a couple of floors to the lobby looking for Jackson. I found him passed out against his cart. He was breathing, but his lips were blue. I helped him sit up against the wall and I called Regina. I didn't know if he needed an ambulance yet or not. He was sweaty and clammy to the touch. 
Whatever had happened to him, it was bad. When Regina got to us, she gave him some of her coffee. He was still shaky, but we got him to talk a little bit. He said he had been getting dizzy, and it just hit him all at once. He had tried to go outside and get some air, but he didn't make it. As he told us all of that, I realized that I was getting dizzy too. When I had been upstairs just then, I was fine. Now, I was getting nauseous. I told Regina to take him outside for a bit. And then I tried to calm myself down and tried to figure out exactly what I was feeling. There was this ringing in my ears that hadn't been there before. I walked around to see if I could shake it off. I noticed that when I stood in a particular part of the lobby, it felt much worse. Almost like a vibration was coming up from right beneath me. Now, in all the time that we had been working there, we never went below the lobby. There were offices down there that we didn't have to clean, but I decided to head downstairs this time. I felt worse the further I got underground. I made it two floors down and I had to catch my breath. And again, it was just offices down there. I kept going until I reached the hall leading to the boiler rooms. That's when it felt like my head was going to vibrate out of my skull. I couldn't even see straight. And now I could hear the vibration itself. It was pounding the walls. I made it to the boiler room door and couldn't go any further. When I got back to the lobby, Jackson looked better, but he still wasn't strong enough to work. I was about ready to throw up, and Regina said she didn't have much left in the tank either. We decided to call it a night and leave. We hoped we would feel better in the morning. We told our boss about what happened. I didn't want him to think that we were slacking off for no reason, or else we'd be in trouble. When we talked about how sick we got, he called the building's property manager. Normally, we would never interact with them because there's no need. But all of a sudden, we're in a meeting with this woman and have to describe everything we did that night. She actually arranged our doctor's appointments. We couldn't get reassigned. Our boss actually wanted us in the building three nights a week instead of one. He offered to triple our pay, so of course, we all took it. Going into that building again and again, it's hard to describe. On some nights, I felt as sick as soon as I walked inside and couldn't work at all. And then other nights, it felt totally normal. Regina and Jackson experienced the same. The property manager gave us a reporting form where we had to document all of our symptoms. I quit as soon as we hit the new year. My body couldn't take the stress and honestly, I learned to be afraid of that building. Jackson left too, but as far as I know, Regina still works that cleaning shift. I think I'll ask her to call in and give you more details. She says she's been getting worse. Hey there, Donovan. I wanted to write in with a dogman story that I experienced about a decade ago. I used to be a railway maintenance worker. I'm now retired, but I have a ton of stories from those days. Some are pretty dark and sad, like bodies being found on the tracks, both human and animal. But generally, servicing the rails was a steady and decent job. Not too overtaxing in terms of physical labor, back when I could still lift a decent amount and had good cardio. These days, retirement has given me a bit of a belly and I'm enjoying myself. These creatures aren't uncommon for railroad maintenance workers to see, especially out in the remote areas. Some stretches of track go through the middle of nowhere, big forests for miles, or just fields once you get further out and west. In fact, if you're on the right crew, there's a good chance everyone will end up telling us stories one night after having a drink or two about what they've seen or experienced. Most of the stories are unbelievable to the point of almost being funny, but every once in a while I'd hear one that would give me the chills. This happened when I was living in Nashville, Tennessee, and I got sent out with the crew to work on a track running south. We started out early in the morning and got our gear on, mostly reflective jackets, boots, and tool belts. The crew takes out a string of machines that can do everything we need out there, like relaying track, taking out or putting in new ties, or leveling. It's loud, dirty, and dangerous work, so everyone needs to be focused on the job. But every once in a while, if there's a lull, like if we're moving from one section to the next, you can take a good look around. The afternoon this happened, I was on a crew with about 10 guys, and we were just finishing up leveling a section that had gotten washed out by heavy rain. There were a few new guys on the crew, and one was in his early 20s. His name was Anthony. He was up ahead of me on the track, securing the new ties when all of a sudden, he shouted. 
The machinery is extremely loud, so it's hard to hear. But I saw him jump up on the car out of the corner of my eye, and he looked up. He was pointing out into the woods. This was an area near a river, so we had a decent view down to the water and then across, where a pump house was stationed on the other side. Not sure if it was active or not. Myself and another service worker followed to where he was pointing and saw what initially looked like a stray dog sniffing around the building. But it quickly became obvious that this wasn't somebody's dog. Even across from the river, we could tell this thing was huge. It stood up on its hind legs and moved a little awkwardly around to the side of the building. We could now see it better than Anthony could. He had scrambled to over where we were on the tracks and asked, what the hell is that? The other guy with us told him, that's a dog man. Anthony looked both scared and like he didn't believe us. The three of us watched this thing, which didn't seem bothered by the loud sounds coming from the side of the river as it checked out the pump house. I'm not sure what it was looking for, but every few seconds it would get back down on all fours and seem to be sniffing around the edge. From what I could tell, it was some sort of gray-brown with a longer snout that reminded me of a German Shepherd. When it stood again, we could see that it was hunched over a bit, as if it wasn't used to standing upright. But it moved around easily enough, and when it reached for the single window on the pump house, there were like hands where there should have been paws. We could see the fingers as it made this fist and knocked on the glass, as if it was trying to see if someone was in there. If there was, I don't blame them for not coming out, but it was probably empty. Most pump houses these days are set to operate on their own, with regular check-ins by maintenance workers. Anthony was still freaked out and sticking pretty close to us. We had about another minute or two watching this dog-like creature, and the guy with us muttered that he had to be close to seven feet tall. Now, if this creature would have been standing next to our machines, it would have had no problem reaching the roof of the lead car. Someone up ahead called that the section we were working on was clear and the lead car started up again with the groan and what sounded like a car backfiring. That caught its attention and we climbed back up on the car that would pull us to the next station, but could still see this thing as we're moving slow at first. When the bang sounded, he quickly turned to the river and seemed caught off guard. He must have seen the movement of the machines and the crew through the trees, but didn't make a move to run or try to hide. For the rest of that day and afternoon, Anthony was in a bit of a daze. That night we stayed in a small town that had a decent pub where a bunch of us went to grab a drink. We went around talking about other dogman sightings, either things we'd seen or we heard other workers seeing on the tracks. I think our goal was to reassure Anthony that these creatures aren't necessarily out to hurt you. I've only heard of them causing trouble, and the one that we saw that day seemed to be looking for something, but he wasn't convinced and he didn't last too long after that. I think he moved on to a desk job. Either way, if this makes it onto your show, thanks. I love listening to your channel and usually have it on while I'm tinkering around the house. I run an animal sanctuary and dog rescue just outside of San Juan. There are massive populations of stray cats and dogs on the island and I do my best to bring them in and help them. We have connections with vets and clinics, and we see a ton of issues, including mange and fleas, as well as malnourished and abandoned animals. We set them up with adopters on the island. Although most adopters come from the mainland, and these animals travel via airplane to meet their rescuers. This started last fall, and has been happening about three times every month since. I'd like to think it was just a coincidence, but it's getting too common for that. The first time it happened, I was shocked, but now it's been over 30 instances and it has only gotten worse. The local police have been no help. Every time I post images on Facebook, they get deleted. I don't know who else to turn to, so I'm hoping someone would have an idea. What it is, is that we've been getting calls about animals in the area acting strangely. They are usually kind of loopy and disoriented. They walk around and teeter as they walk. Usually if they try to jump up or walk upstairs, they lose their balance and sometimes trip over themselves. This is both cats and dogs. It's happening all over the island, from downtown San Juan to the outskirts and more rural areas. Our team will bring the animals in. 
and after about a week they start to act normally again. It's a slow process. It's like they're inebriated when they first come in, and it lasts maybe three days. And then one morning they'll wake up and be very skittish. They'll start moving quicker and sometimes will snap at us, but they are mostly just nervous. Then, after a few days of being hyper nervous, there will be a full day of aggression. The dogs will be barking through the bars of the cages and foaming at the mouth. The cats will stick their paws out of the bars and swat at the crew passing by. We ended up with a ton of bite marks and scratches from the first few animals we brought in. This was before we noticed the pattern of how it plays out. Now we've learned to quarantine each animal that comes in with this disorderly behavior and will not let them interact until after the final day of aggression. After that, the animal may just be the sweetest or the most typical stray. And then we start to post them on adoption websites. None of the adopters have complained about behavioral problems. In fact, they all seem to love their new dogs and cats. They even send me photos and videos of them snuggling with the whole family, even kids. They just act so odd for this first week, which is part of what we don't understand. One person who called in about one of the strays said they saw the animal being thrown from the back of a black van, without any distinguishing marks. Really, it's despicable what people do to vulnerable animals, but unfortunately, it's not unheard of. On the next call that came in, I asked the person if they'd seen a black van go by, and they said that in fact there was. One was speeding by just a bit earlier, and its speed had caught their attention. I was just shocked because I thought maybe the animals were just eating something bad, but now I believe they are being tested on or something else. The reason I'm writing to you and not a veterinary clinic or animal control is because I believe there is something strange going on, and there's probably some type of organization that is making these animals act this way. After we started getting so many of these calls and bringing in the strays that acted loopy, we began plotting down their locations on a map. Basically, the map shows a one mile radius around the business district. I don't want to disclose the particular area because I don't want anyone to get hurt, but I went and checked out the area myself. What I found was a bunch of warehouses and factories and shipping container lots that had been abandoned. So I was surprised when I saw a very new and very clean black van driving around. I hightailed it out of there because I didn't want to be seen looking around and get myself into trouble. But I called the local police to discuss it. They told me that they can't do anything about it, unless I actually witness something happening and get concrete evidence or a plate number. Which is absurd because the van or vans that we've been seeing are unmarked. At least, I've never seen a plate. I contacted a friend at Animal Control to see if they've been noticing this behavior, and they said that they have. Another shelter also noticed a similar trend. There are a few Facebook groups that I'm in, and the shelters that are further from the capital say they have not been experiencing this. So I know something odd is going on, and I hope that somebody out there might be able to shed some light on it. Please let me know if my story corresponds to anything you've heard in the past. I'm a big fan of the supernatural podcasts and ghost stories. I've always been. My wife is really into the murder podcasts, so we are a morbid household. I like the idea that there are things in this world that we can't explain. I think humans need to be humbled sometimes because we like to pretend that we know everything, which is why it's so weird that for years I forgot about a string of odd encounters I had as a child. It's funny the way our brains are wired. I hadn't thought about any of these encounters until I had a conversation with my brother recently. They weren't terrifying memories or anything like that, so I don't know why my brain pushed them to the back of my mind. Maybe I used to talk about my experiences more, but people always gave me funny looks, so I stopped. The first time I saw the little girl, I was somewhere between 7 and 9 years old. I can't remember exactly how old I was, but everything else about the occurrence is crystal clear. I was sleeping in my room when I woke up to a hand shaking my shoulder. A little girl around my age with light brown hair was standing next to my bed telling me to wake up. She was wearing a strange looking sleeping gown. It was red with lace and puffy parts sewn in. She ran out of the room laughing. 
I was groggy from sleeping and I assumed she was my older sister being a brat and waking me up early on the weekend. I stomped out of the room after her, but the hallway was empty. I went downstairs into the kitchen. My mom and sister were both there at the counter, cooking pancakes on the griddle. Mom, Katie woke me up, I said. Katie's my sister. They both just looked at me in confusion. I then realized my sister was wearing a white t-shirt and not a nightgown. When did you change? Neither of them knew what was going on, and that made me even more irritated. My mom had to calm me down, and I explained what happened with the little girl in the red nightgown who woke me up. She told me it was just a dream. At the time, I thought she was right. A few months later, I saw her again. I think it was late summer or early fall, around Labor Day, because me and my family were headed to my uncle's house for a family cookout. We were all in the car ready to go, but my mom forgot to grab her purse. I was in the seat closest to the door, so she made me get out of the car to go get it. Of course, I made a big fuss about it because it was a pain in the butt as a child. Her purse was upstairs in my parents' bedroom, so I went into the house to go grab it. I specifically remember running up the stairs on all fours like an animal, because I was a kid and kids are weird like that. As I rounded the corner to my parents' room, I heard someone humming. It wasn't a tune that I knew. It just sounded like mindless humming of a playing child. I was a little scared, but I poked my head around the door frame to peek inside the room. The little girl was sitting on the floor with her back to me, rolling a small wooden ball back and forth between her hands. There was no mistaking her from my sister this time. I stood as still as possible. I was afraid she would notice me. I saw my mom's purse on the dresser behind the little girl. I thought about making a dash for it, but she snapped her head in my direction and started to giggle. A giggling little girl in a nightgown should not be scary, but she didn't belong there, so I ran back to the car. I told my mom I couldn't find her purse. She scoffed and went to get it herself. I got an earful when she came back and told me that it was right where she said it was. I think she could tell I was shaken up by something. So she stopped lecturing me when she saw that my mind was a million miles away. I haven't thought about either of those strange occurrences or hauntings, if you want to call them that, for years, but two months ago, I was talking to my brother over a few drinks, and he told me something that brought those memories crashing back. When he was younger, he would refuse to go upstairs by himself. We used to tease him about it and chalked it up to him being a scared little kid. We were rehashing old stories about him refusing to go upstairs as a child when he told me that he didn't like going upstairs back then because he would always hear a little girl giggling and sounds of small feet scampering around. He said his toys were always rearranged when he left them out in his room, like someone else had come in and played with them. Hearing this made my spine crawl. I felt some conflicting emotions. On one hand, I was a little upset to be reminded of the creepy occurrences from my childhood, but it also made me feel validated because what I saw was not just a figment of my own imagination. Normally, I would have kept this story to myself and a few close friends, but after talking to my brother and comparing our experiences, he convinced me to reach out to you. Maybe we are both just a little bit crazy, or maybe there are some things that are out there that we just don't understand. I don't know why there would be any kind of spirit in my parents' house. It was built by them, so no one else has ever lived in it. I know it all used to be farmland before it became a suburban development. My only guess is that she is somehow tied to the land. To be honest, I'd rather not dig any deeper into it. I was hiking a remote trail in the Rockies with my three German shepherds a few years ago. I was carrying a relatively heavy pack, filled with water and other supplies, for Elvis, Luca, and Teddy, so I wasn't moving quickly enough to suit them. I knew I was probably the only human around for miles, so I let my dogs off their leashes so they could explore. All three dogs were well trained, and always come back immediately when I call for them, so I didn't really think there was any harm in it. A few miles in, I whistled for the dogs so we could take a water break. All three dogs came from different directions, panting happily and glad to get a snack. It was a gorgeous day, and the rock I was sitting on was warm from the sun. 
My dogs all curled up in the grass nearby, and even though I didn't mean to, I dozed off for a little while. I couldn't have been asleep for more than 20 minutes, but when I woke up, it was absolute chaos. All three dogs were barking hysterically, with lots of growls and yelps. I couldn't see them, but it sounded like they were close by. I scrambled off the trail towards the sound, and I could hear a new noise. It was a deep, low-pitched moan. I immediately thought that the dogs had cornered a bear. I ran back to my pack and grabbed the leashes and the bear spray that was inside my pocket, then crashed back through the trees yelling the dogs' names. I was getting closer to them. I kept pushing through the branches and foliage, desperate to find them. Just after walking through a cloud of what smelled like the worst B.O. ever, I finally saw the three dogs, and then I saw what they were barking at. There were two of them backed up against a giant boulder at the top of a short rise in the forest floor. I'm nearly six feet tall, but I could tell that they were much taller than that. They looked human, except for the fact that their naked bodies were covered head to toe in this thick black coarse hair. They also looked terrified. I was scared out of my wits, but I almost felt bad for them. They were making these calm down motions towards the dogs with their hands and making low sounds that seemed soothing. Luca, my largest German Shepherd, was nearly hysterical. His muzzle was flecked with foam, and he was dancing around trying to decide if he should go in closer. Elvis stopped barking and started sniffing the ground, still a good distance away from the cornered creatures, but definitely getting curious. Teddy dropped back to my side the second he saw me, whining softly and trying to shove his muzzle into the hand that was clutching the bear spray. I didn't feel threatened, nor did I think the creatures menace any harm. I crouched down and set the bear spray on the ground, and started mirroring their calm down motions with my hands as I slowly stepped closer. I quickly approached the other two dogs, clipping their leashes onto their harness and pulling them away. I spoke softly and calmly hoping that they would feed off my energy, and realized that we weren't in any danger. As I tried to quiet Luca, I kept glancing at the creatures to make sure they were in the same spot. They hadn't moved. Luca finally stopped barking but kept making these low growls. I didn't want to turn my back on the creatures so I walked backwards, guiding the two dogs back to where Teddy was standing. I attached his leash to his harness. Once all three dogs were under control, I finally asked myself, now what? The creatures seemed to be having a conversation. They weren't using words exactly, but their vocalizations had a rhythm, and they were gesturing at me, waving their arms around. They didn't seem upset, they seemed curious just like me. Now things were calming down. I was able to understand the magnitude of the situation. I was face to face with a Sasquatch, two of them. I had an incredible opportunity. I decided to try to engage with them, hoping that the dogs would cooperate. I found a tree that seemed sturdy enough and quickly unhooked each dog and looped the leashes around the trunk. They would be secure, but also unable to help me if anything went wrong. I decided to stay close. I picked the bear spray back up, then I tried to make eye contact with the creatures. I locked eyes with the smaller one, and I smiled to show that I was friendly. It smiled back, then the taller one followed suit. Feeling brave, I motioned with a come closer wave. They moaned to each other, then they came directly towards me. The smaller one came quickly and stretched out its hand towards the dogs. Even Elvis cooperated and let the creature stroke his ears. All of them were sniffing excitedly. The taller one approached me, also with its hand outstretched. Before I realized what was happening, it was trying to stroke my ears, then ran its hand over my short hair. They smelled terrible, but they were incredibly gentle. Suddenly, both creatures seemed to respond to some sound that I couldn't hear. They picked their heads up, and after a few seconds, I heard the sounds of a helicopter nearby. After a final pat of my dogs and me, both creatures hurried off into the thick trees. I stood for a few minutes, overcome by what I had just experienced. Then I untied my dogs and went to collect my pack, and headed back towards the trailhead. I looked over my shoulder the entire time but I never saw them again. I never believed in aliens until two of them were standing in my bedroom. I woke up in the middle of the night. 
I reached for my water bottle and sat up to take a sip. There were two humanoid figures standing at the end of my bed. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't scared. I was immediately filled with an incredible calm that spread throughout my entire body. I knew that I should be scared, but my fight or flight system couldn't combat the peace that I felt. I looked at my sleeping wife to see if she sensed anything happening, but she just kept snoring softly. The aliens didn't have green skin. It was shiny and looked like fish scales. They weren't wearing clothes. Their heads looked exactly like the images you see on posters and bumper stickers, with gigantic black eyes and tiny holes where their noses should be. Their fingers were thin and very long. They made little chirpy sounds that sounded like conversation in a language that I didn't recognize. I watched very interested as they both walked into the bathroom. My wife doesn't like the dark, so we leave a small nightlight on in there in case she ever needed to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. In the weak light, I watched them examine the stuff on the counter, like toothbrushes and lotions. They didn't touch anything, but I heard their chirps and they sounded excited. They opened a few of the drawers and I saw one of them hold up a cotton swab. He showed it to his friend, and they took turns sniffing it and turning it over in their hands. They moved out of my line of sight, so I calmly got up and went into the bathroom too. I found both of them standing near the toilet. They were touching it, and one of them pushed the lever and flushed the toilet, and they both jumped back. Then they moved towards the bathtub, and to my surprise, both of them climbed in. They looked at me expectantly, so I walked over and turned on the tap. Both of them seemed impressed, stretching out their long fingers to feel the water that was gushing out. I adjusted the temperature, and they made these satisfying chirps as the water warmed up. One of them gestured towards the knob that activated the shower spray. I shook my head, worried about blasting them with water. It gestured again, and in my weird calm, I decided to go for it. I turned the knob and the water poured out of the shower head onto their fish scales. They made these shrieky sounds, but it really sounded like laughter. They spent a few minutes splashing each other, then gestured to me to turn it off. Because things were already really weird, I handed them both bath towels, and I mimed drying my skin, and they understood immediately and dried themselves, chirping happily the whole time. They dropped the towels on the floor and headed back out into the bedroom. They gestured for me to climb back into bed. I did, taking another sip of water as I settled under the covers, and then I drifted off to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, that beautiful sense of calm was gone. My eyes shot open and I looked frantically around the room. Nothing seemed to miss, and for a second I thought that it was just a strange room. Just then my wife came out of the bathroom and she asked me why there were two wet towels on the floor. I told her what I had experienced that night, but she didn't believe me. She said it was just a dream. I don't know, it seems so real. This strange creature attacked Toby in Shenandoah National Park during their hike up Old Rag. He took this picture right before the attack happened. His friend Nick sent me this story to stories at dread.army. Now stick around because I'm going to analyze this photo a little later. Let's hear what he had to say. Hi Donovan. This happened last spring, but I never saw your channel until last week. I'm glad I found you so I can spread the word. I've got proof that these creatures really do exist. Enclosed is a picture my buddy snapped right before he got attacked. Now the authorities are trying to cover it up. Here's what happened. Me and Toby are both experienced hikers. We've always wanted to do the old rag mountain hike in Virginia at Shenandoah. It's like a bucket list thing. We both finally got some time off work and decided to go for it. The thing about this trail is they don't allow you to camp above 2,800 feet, and the summit is just over 3,500 feet, so we decided to backcountry camp in the Berry Hollow area. This was on a Tuesday night, and there were some cars in the parking area, but we didn't see a soul in the woods. Kind of surprising because it's a popular hike, but it was in late May while school was still in session. We found a sweet spot about a mile and a half from the parking area and set up our tent. We didn't stay up late since we wanted an early start. I woke up in the middle of night 
and then I laid there for a minute trying to figure out why I woke up. I heard it then. Something was walking around the campsite. I sat up and listened, but I didn't panic. I figured it was a deer close by, so I laid back down. No growling or grunting. Nothing to worry about, right? Toby slept right through it. It went quiet after a minute, and I fell back asleep. I told Toby about it the next morning. We both took a look around the campsite. There was an acrid smell in the air, and we figured maybe it was a buck marking its territory. That is, until we saw the prints in the dirt at the edge of the clearing. It wasn't hooves, it was feet. It was very odd shape, tracks that neither one of us have ever seen before. They were bigger than our own feet, with claws on the end, but too skinny to be a bear's. There were only four toes and they were kind of spread out like a bird's foot is. We looked at it for a minute, but it was kind of smudged, so we couldn't really say for sure what it was. We didn't worry too much about it. We were psyched to begin our hike. It's just over a five mile hike to get from where we camp to the overlook. You gotta go down Weekly Hollow Fire Road for two and a half miles, then turn onto Ridge Trail. From there, it's just shy of three miles to the overlook. It's real strenuous though. Even though we were doing this midweek, we wanted to start early cause it got crowded. So we walked for a ways and everything seemed perfect. Great weather, nice woodsy trail. We carried day packs with snacks and water and stopped every now and then to take a break. When we turned onto Ridge Trail, it got more difficult. There's these areas in the woods where it's not obvious which way to go. We had read in the guidebook to look for blue paint marking the way but we didn't see any of those marks. Maybe that's only on the rocks above the tree lines, I don't know. I was starting to think we got turned around. Then I saw a break in the tree line ahead, and I knew we were on the right track. I yelled to Toby, we're getting close, and to hurry up. He yelled back for me to go ahead and he'd catch up. He had to see a man about a horse. I cracked up, because that was so like him. But I went on ahead getting to the first ridge above the tree line. It wasn't the summit, but all of a sudden you could see for a ways, and it was amazing. Then I hear Toby scream. Like, not a yell, but a scream of pain. I ran back as fast as I could, yelling his name. Looking back and forth on both sides of the trail, totally panicked. I saw his blue jacket through the brush on the side of the trail, and I ran to him. He was on the ground. He was bleeding and his jacket was all ripped. He was alive though, thank God. I thought it must have been a bear, and the hair on the back of my neck was all standing up as I yelled for help. Toby opened his eyes, and I could tell he was in a lot of pain. Blood wasn't spurting out, but it was slowly seeping. I pushed away his jacket to look, and he had a huge claw mark going down from his shoulder across his pecs to the left. I yelled for help again, and fished a windbreaker out of my pack, pressing it to the wound. He said something and I couldn't understand it at first. I realized he was saying, picture, phone, and then he passed out. I looked around and saw his phone and picked it up and put it in my pocket, my mind going in a million directions. I needed to get help immediately and there's no signal up there. I didn't think I could carry him out. I started yelling for help again, like every five seconds, and thankfully I got someone's attention. A man came by and I shouted for him to go get a ranger. My buddy's been hurt. There's a ranger stationed at the junction of Weekly Road and Ridge Trail. I checked and the wound was seeping blood, but I didn't think Toby was in danger of bleeding out. I kept one hand on the jacket pressing down and fished his phone out. I needed to see the picture. I was in shock when I opened the phone and this picture popped up. It looks like a dinosaur. This thing was in the woods here with us. I was totally freaked out looking around, hoping it wouldn't come back. I didn't have to wait long for help to arrive. I just said I didn't know what attacked him. I needed them to focus on my buddy at that point, and to be honest, I was doubting my own eyes. I wanted to look at the picture real good before I told someone about it. They got Toby to the hospital, and I looked at the picture again. Unbelievable, the proof was right there. I hit share on his phone and sent a copy to myself. I then showed the picture to the ranger who was there to take my statement. I told him that Toby had snapped it right before he was attacked. I also mentioned that something had been at our campsite the night before. Maybe this thing had been stalking us. 
I handed over the phone waiting to see his face when he saw the creature. He totally shut down, no expression at all. He just said, hmm, okay, I need to hang on this to show my supervisor. I said, what is that thing? And he just said that they would investigate. Toby's okay. The biggest concern was infection, but they took good care of him. But you know what? The authorities somehow misplaced his phone. Yeah, of course they did. The official report says my buddy was attacked by a bear. Does this look like a bear to you? It was a cover up plain and simple. That ranger wasn't surprised. I bet he already knew about that creature. I'm glad I have proof, and now you guys do too. Okay, now let's take a closer look at this photo. The first thing that I notice is that the overall photo is pretty blurry. That could be explained due to the camera lens being a little bit blurry. They were out in the woods after all. Does that make the photo unauthentic? Not necessarily. The second thing is, is this beast did appear to come out of nowhere. There's a small clearing towards the top of the picture that it looks like it's coming down from. Now there are a few areas that I think are a little suspect. Take a look at the creature's feet. They are a little odd shaped. And then let's look at this creature's mouth. If this truly is authentic, I would never want to run into this thing. Its mouth looks absolutely terrifying. You can't really tell from the way the picture was taken what its face looks like. Those are just my observations. I would love to know what you guys all think in the comments below. Back in the day, me and my friends used to think it was entertaining to go out late at night and shoot at raccoons. I'm not proud of it now, but it was just what we did back then. It was part of the culture just to blast any undesirable critter. I grew up in the South in Arkansas, and raccoons were considered really big pests. I mean, they got into everything, the garden, the trash. We even had them try to come in through the screen of our kitchen window. Nobody would judge us for going out and shooting them. I'm a lot more considerate of animals now. If I even try to tell this story to my wife, I just get shut down as a barbaric fool. So I figured I would tell you what we went up against this one night. I never really had a chance to talk about this outside of those friends who were with me. We know what we saw, but sometimes we even start to question our own eyes. It was probably around October, back in maybe 2003 or so. We were fooling around, having some drinks and whatnot, and we decided to go coon hunting. Mostly we were just bored and didn't feel like going to bed yet. It was close to midnight my parents were asleep. We started out like always down this trail behind my house. We went down this steep section full of sweet shrub towards this gully where we knew some ground burrows were. There were a lot of raccoons that lived down there. It wasn't too far from my house. There was a shallow stream down there and we would see them drinking sometimes. We crossed over the stream and started walking up the hill. There is this good spot with a lot of big stones where we could kind of hide out. We settled in and took cover and scoped out the area. I had my shotgun across my knees. My friends didn't have theirs since we really hadn't planned this. We sat there trying to keep quiet. We were a little buzzed so we kept bursting out laughing over nothing. We watched over any movement but we didn't see anything at all. It actually seemed extra quiet that night. No crickets or anything. It started to get pretty cold, and we weren't exactly dressed for the weather. After about an hour of that, we decided we should give up and head back. I had this field spotlight with a hunting lens, and I thought I would take another look before we called it a night. I turned it on and we saw something about 20 feet away. It was on all fours with its nose on the ground. We couldn't tell if it was eating something or what. It sure wasn't any raccoon. The spotlight coming on didn't even seem to phase it at all, but it sure made it look towards us. That's when things got scary. It took a step towards us and lifted up on the two legs. It started growling this really low guttural growl. It stretched itself up and puffed out its chest. It had this really thick coat of fur around its neck. To me, it looked like it was at least six or seven feet tall, and the claws on that thing were like two inches long. It bared its teeth and it reminded me of my friend's Doberman Pinscher when it used to corner something. It even smelled like a really dirty wet dog. 
We were all just staring at it completely petrified. For a minute, it felt like a standoff. It took another step towards us and I had my shotgun leveled. I fired a shot and hit that thing right in the side of its ribs. Usually hitting something that close with a 12 gauge shotgun would cause a big hole and a typical animal wouldn't walk away from it. A spray of blood burst out of that creature and it let out this loud yelp, but the shot didn't knock it down. We were shocked that it just started sprinting away and ran out of my circle of light. My friends were freaking out and yelling at me to shoot it again. I fired two more times at it, but it was so fast that it got out of my range really quick and I missed it. We got up and started following in the direction it ran. I mean, talk about fools. It's hard to believe how stupid we were when we were that young. We went for about 10 feet and found this large pool of blood. Then we went a little further and found a smaller pool of blood. We kept going and spotting footprints that we could follow. We eventually stopped and looked at each other and realized how stupid we were being. Plus, we didn't know if this thing traveled in packs or what. Who knows how many of them there could have been. The way it looked, we were thinking we had encountered a real life werewolf. We started imagining that thing laying low for us and watching us, getting ready for its revenge. We were really scared by then and started heading mostly in the direction of my house. But every little sound would freak us out and we would take cover wherever we could. It took us a long time to make it all the way back to my house since we were convinced that that thing was watching us. We made it back and went to bed and really never mentioned it to anybody. Like I said, I've tried to tell my wife, but I just start feeling like a fool. I'm hoping that somebody else hearing this will know what I'm talking about. It's so weird to have an experience like that and know that most people will just think you're crazy. I'd like to just be honest here and tell you that I remember everything that happened that night. But the truth is, I'm still not exactly sure what happened. I'm from New Jersey and we go down the Wildwood, about an hour from me on the shore. Every summer I spend time on the beach and on the boardwalk. We usually go towards the end of the season. Just past Labor Day, there are fewer and fewer people out there, and it's easier to find a spot to set up your towel. It's still sunny and pretty hot during the day, but at night, it can get kind of chilly. It's not the nicest area, but the prices are pretty cheap, and it's easy to have fun since there's so much to do. Anyways, my friends and I decided to go in together on a motel room. There were five of us and only two double beds, so it was pretty crowded in there. Somehow I got relegated to the pull-out couch and that thing was super uncomfortable. The hotel was kind of sleazy and smelled like smoke and mold, but we were just trying to have a good time, you know? We were out hitting the beach bars and partying all day. So once we got back to the motel room, we were kind of wiped out. There wasn't much else to do, so everyone just wanted to head to bed so that we could get up early and hit the beach. We all laid down for bed like at 2 a.m. I started to hear snoring from my friends like a minute later, but I just couldn't fall asleep. I was tossing and turning for an hour when I decided I just needed to go for a walk. I put on my flip flops and sweatshirt and headed out the door. It was pretty chilly out and the wind was kind of brutal once in a while. There was a full moon so the whole place had an eerie feeling to it. You can't see the stars when you're in the town, so I decided to head towards the beach so I could get a better look. I was starting to sober up but I wasn't completely sober at that point. I still know what I saw though. I walked out of the motel and down the road for a bit. No one was really out except for the people leaving the bars and some strange vagabonds on the road. Once I got to the boardwalk, it got a bit more lively. There were some places still open, but I stuck with my plan of checking out the beach at night. The thing about Wildwood is the beach is really huge and I don't mean width wise. It's extremely long, and when you're walking to the water on a hot summer day, your feet will start to burn on the sand. Even during high tide, the walk can be almost 10 minutes if you're carrying all of your beach gear, shovels, and umbrellas. But while I was walking at night, it felt like it was super quick. No one else was out at that point, so when I got to the water's edge, I was surprised to see a figure in the waves. The moon was shining down on the waves as they broke. The white caps would sparkle. About 30 feet away in the water, I could see the outline of a person. It was kind of a vague form, 
and there wasn't much light to go by. I pulled out my phone and turned on my flashlight, as I called over to them to make sure they were okay. They were standing in the water, but it didn't make sense, because the water would be super deep, and it didn't even seem like they were struggling. The waves pulled back for a moment, and I realized that the person wasn't a person at all. The figure was really the tentacle of a squid or something. I don't know, I've never been a believer in sea monsters or anything like that but it raised another tentacle out of the water, and I could see the suckers on the arm. It started to slide towards me on the shore, so I took a step back on the beach. The thing rose a bit out of the water, and I could see a big hump that I think was its head or its body. Then it ducked back down into the waves, and all that was left was a splash. I really don't know what that thing was. I tried to tell my friends, and they just thought I was crazy. They just don't get it. I know what I saw and it was huge. Ever since, I've been too scared to go back in the ocean. And honestly, even pools get me a little nervous. If anyone has seen anything similar, I'd love to hear about it. Thanks for listening and stay safe out there. Hey there, Dread. I'm enjoying your channel and I thought you'd be interested in something weird I noticed at Los Angeles Airport. I drive an aviation fuel truck at LAX, so I get all around the airport and I pretty much see everything. Most days though, I'm close to the terminal, refueling planes before they take off. One day, when I'd just driven back to the fuel farm to refill the truck, I got a call asking me to make an unscheduled fueling. They said the plane I was supposed to do next hadn't arrived anyway. I was told to go out to this hangar that I'd never been to before. Since we usually refuel planes at the terminal, I was kind of surprised. When I got out to this small hangar, I saw just one small regional jet sitting outside. I checked, and it was the one I was supposed to refuel, so I attached the ground wire and then the fuel hose like I always do. While I waited for the plane to fill up, I looked around and noticed there was another hangar, a few hundred feet away or so from the one I was at. That hangar kind of looked old, and it was fairly small too not big enough for an Airbus A350 or something like that. As I watched, black cars and SUVs kept coming and going by that little hangar. Instead of the mechanics and fuelers who wear orange safety vests like me, I saw guys wearing black or blue jumpsuits. I don't know, it wasn't just the outfits. Something about them looked different than regular airport workers. The small plane didn't take long to get fueled. I took off the ground wire, disconnected the hose, and got back into the truck, and recorded it on the refuel sheet. Once I finished, I looked over towards that hangar again. I didn't see anyone going in or out, just cars parked in front, so I decided just to drive by it on my way back to the terminal. I didn't think anyone would notice a fueling truck just getting a little too close to it. I don't know why, but when I got close, I decided to roll down the window. I didn't get more than 50 feet or so from the cars parked in front but I heard a banging noise coming from inside the hangar. It didn't sound like anything you'd expect to hear from a hangar. Not like a plane engine or a mechanic working on a plane. When I heard that noise, I pictured huge fists pounding on metal. I don't know why. I told myself I was being crazy, but then I heard a roar coming out of that hangar, like King Kong or something. I rolled up the window and drove away. I was sure something was going on in that hangar. When I got home that night, I checked Google Earth to see if I could find that hangar, but I couldn't see it. It wasn't on the map. It wasn't on the map I had of the hangars at LAX either. I mean, I could see if it was too small to be on my map, but why wasn't it on Google Earth? That was weird. I hadn't seen any signs on it indicating what it was either. I thought I'd try to get over there again sometime and see if I could get a better look at it, but our schedules are pretty tight. We go from one refueling to the next, and there's really no extra time, unless a plane gets stuck at another airport. Finally, one day a plane couldn't make it to LAX because of a mechanical issue, and I had an extra hour to kill. I had to go to the fueling farm to fill the truck, but I had enough time to swing by that hangar. This time, I looked at the hangar itself more closely. I didn't see any markings on it, no names of airlines that use it, no numbers. Just three cars were in front of it this time. One guy came out in a dark jumpsuit as I drove by, but he was hurrying into one of the cars, and I don't think he noticed my truck. After his car pulled away, I drove closer, 
I rolled down the window and heard banging again. This time it sounded like a fight. I swear it sounded like two big monsters in there throwing each other around against the walls. But I don't know, maybe it was something else. All I know is it didn't sound normal. The next day I was really surprised that I got a break again. In fact, I had even more time because a bunch of flights got grounded in Chicago for weather. We were just sitting around with hardly any planes to refuel. When the truck needed more fuel, I headed back to the fuel farm with at least a two hour break ahead of me. This time, I went to that smaller hangar that I'd first seen that weird hangar from. I thought if I parked near it for a while, no one would notice. I sat there and ate my lunch, just kind of idly watching the mysterious hangar. From that far away, there was no way I could hear anything, even with the windows down, so I just watched. Cars came and went, and then a plain white truck that looked like a big moving van backed in. The driver didn't get out. I wondered if they were loading something into the back. A few minutes later, another truck just like it backed in. I was going crazy wishing I could see what they were doing, but the way that they were backed in totally blocked my view. Both vans pulled out after that. All the cars parked there slowly left. Once they were all gone, I drove the truck up to the hangar. I got really close this time and rolled down the window. I heard nothing. It was totally quiet. I figured whatever was in that hangar was gone. They must have taken it away in the trucks. I still don't know what it was. Since then, anytime I manage to go by that hangar, it's totally quiet. But something tells me that they're going to put something else in there. I'm going to keep watching it and see what happens. This story was submitted on dreadsarmy.com. Hey Donovan. About five years ago, me and a buddy of mine decided to do a long road trip during the summer. We were just out of college and we wanted to go look around the country before we got tied down to a job. We wanted to travel around the US and kind of scope out different areas to see if a particular state might appeal to us. We had spent our whole lives living in Missouri, and that was all we really knew. We spent most of our time camping in the US Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management areas. We were driving my four-wheel drive pickup truck, so we could really get back into some fairly deep wilderness on the forest roads. After about a month on the road, we ended up on some land near Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park in Colorado. It was our last night in Colorado, and we were exhausted from doing a 14-mile hike earlier that morning. Colorado had been a real venture for us, with those incredible Rocky Mountains. There was an option of camping at the National Park, but that would have cost us money. We were still basically just broke college kids. We had found the GPS coordinates for a dispersed camping site online. That led us to the end of a paved road in the evening around 7 p.m. We came to this dirt road that went up through some trees and brush. It didn't look well traveled at all, but that was how we tended to like it. Those out of the way kind of roads had taken us up some pretty spectacular scenery. This dirt road made its way to the top of a hill that had some amazing views of snow-capped mountains. We didn't pass a car the entire way up. It was a pretty rough road, but my truck made it up to the campsite easily. When we got there, we sat in the truck, scoping it out. It wasn't the best site we'd been to, but it wasn't the worst either. There was no restroom of any kind, but there was a fire pit and lots of trees. But we also saw an abandoned couch and some other odd signs of human trash. It actually started feeling a little bit off-putting. The vibes were kind of weird, but it was getting late and we were too tired to look for something better. We got out of the truck and started walking around. We found some garbage bags wrapped in duct tape. I was like, this seems like a place that we would find a body or something. My friend agreed. Neither one of us loved the setting. We noticed a trail that seemed to go up in a circle around the top of a hill. We decided to check that out before we committed to staying. We found some more trash and what looked like old clothes, but nothing that made us feel like we should leave. It was getting close to dark, so we decided to cowboy camp instead of setting up all of our gear. That meant just sleeping on a tarp in our sleeping bags under the stars. That 14 mile hike we did earlier that day had really taken it out of us, and we weren't completely used to the altitude yet. Back in Missouri, we were at something like 500 feet altitude, and now we're up over 8,000 feet. We figured we would get a nice fire going and have a few by the fire. 
but even with a nice buzz going, we still felt a little uneasy. Every couple of minutes, one of us would shine a light into the woods. We kept thinking that we heard something, even though this was like our 30th consecutive night sleeping outside. It didn't exactly feel comfortable, but it was late, so we started getting ready for bed. We had our bear spray and headlamps ready. I stepped into the woods to go to the bathroom and walked in about 10 feet into the trees. I was standing there and I started hearing this sound of something crashing through the woods. I turned on my headlamp and my knees almost buckled. In the center of my beam was a bunch of bleached bones lying there in a pile. That in combination with the crashing sounds was giving me some serious panic. If I hadn't already been going to the bathroom, I probably would have went in my pants. I yelled out to my friend, get over here. I don't know why I just didn't run back to the truck. He ran over and shined his headlamp on the scene in front of us. That's when we started hearing this growling sound and smelling this horrible garbage smell, like really rotten garbage. We were kind of just mesmerized by the sight of those bones, and we kept angling our headlamps back and forth to try to illuminate the trees as much as we could. Then our lights caught sight of this demonic looking face with a large snout. Whatever it was was just crouching there snarling at us. Then all of a sudden it stood up on its back legs. It looked something like a giant hyena, about six or seven feet tall. The consensus between us was, screw this. We ran back to our camp and threw our stuff into the truck, and we got the hell out of there as fast as we could. We drove down that pitted dirt road faster than I ever thought possible. I kept driving until we got to the National Park campground. I never felt so happy to pay $25 and have neighbors nearby. It scared the bloody hell out of us, and we still have no idea what it was. This story was sent in to stories at dread.army. Hey Donovan, I'm a new subscriber, and I've been binge watching and listening to your content. You're in luck. I've been wanting to tell this story, but I haven't found the right place to do so until now. Ever since I can remember, I've had an interest in the paranormal and alien UFO phenomenon. My ex, with whom I was with at the time of this experience, was far from that. Right out of the Air Force, she became a cop for a nearby town. Her father was a cop, and I believe his father was a cop. So needless to say, they were pretty thick-skinned. About 10 years ago, I was at her place in a small town called Pacific Grove, near Monterey Bay. She lived right off the ocean in a short walk from what's called Lover's Point. Well, one night I was over at her place and we decided to take her dog for a walk. I hated that dog and that dog didn't like me, but walk we did. It was around 8.30 p.m. Completely dark out, we started walking out towards the ocean, then down the roads towards Lover's Point. As you get closer to Lover's Point, you can see over across the bay, overlooking Monterey and Seaside. There's an Embassy Suites in Seaside, which is dead straight on as you walk up to the point. It's the tallest building on the city skyline. As we got closer to the point, I told her, wow, look at that star, it's a bright one. She asked, what star? I said, the one next to the Embassy Suites building. Right at that moment, I realized it wasn't a star. It was a plane, possibly a helicopter. We both stared at it thinking, what in the heck is that? The bright light continued to slowly move towards us. We could see the light reflecting off the ocean as it cruised right over the bay. We just stared dumbfounded trying to figure out what it was. It continued to come in our direction until it glided right over us, then banked left and glided over Pacific Grove then Monterey, and eventually flew out of sight. This was massive. As it glided right over us, I could see it was triangular shaped, with round lights emitting from the bottom. They were symmetrically oriented under the craft. It had a triangular tail wing to it, with round lights shooting out of the back. It must have been five or six hundred feet above us, and it was huge. The whole time we're watching it, I could still hear the waves crashing down the hill, about 80 feet away. So this thing was silent, absolutely no noise. Now, I'm a believer, but my ex wasn't. And she kept saying, whoa, what is that? Wait, what is that? I had just bought a new smartphone, but neither one of us were smart enough to pull it out and take pictures of this. 
It was jaw-dropping and stunned us to where the last thing on our mind was to take pictures. After it cleared the sky, we slowly walked back to our place in pure amazement, shock, and all around like what in the heck just happened feeling. The moment I walked in, I hopped on the computer to check out the local outlets or to see if anyone else called that in. She was still in shock. To my surprise, no other reports were made and I was checking on it all night and the following days. Someone else had to have seen this thing. It glided so effortlessly over the bay in the city. It was big. It blocked out most of the sky as we looked straight up. For it to be silent like that to where we could hear the waves crashing, it either was far higher than I thought, which would have made this thing a mile wide at least, or it was a silent flying craft. Far, far too large to be a drone. Plus, there was no buzzing sounds. Nothing. Completely silent. The following days, I thought, did that really happen? She was now a believer, and I finally got to see an unidentified flying object. Don't take my word for it, she has since married, which I'm not sure what her new last name is, but you can look her up. Her name is Jessica Smith, and she works at the police department. I believe she currently lives in Monterey. She wouldn't want to hear from me, but if you ask her to corroborate this story, I guarantee she will tell you the exact same thing I said. I've been wanting to tell this story, but wanted the right place to do so. I like the way you narrate and everything sounds very credible. Her and I don't talk anymore. It's been 10 years since we last spoke. She doesn't like me whatsoever, but I know she will stand behind the story if asked. Here is a rough idea on what this thing looked like. I will never forget it. I may be off on the number of round lights on the bottom, but you get the idea. It looked like something from Star Wars or something. It appeared to be smooth, but the light was so bright under it. It was hard to tell the color or any other features. Please let me know if you need any other information. I told my wife this morning, this is the guy I want to tell my story. I'm sure you get a lot of emails, so I completely understand if this doesn't make the cut. You have great content either way, and happy to be a new subscriber of your channel. This story was posted on the forums on dreadsarmy.com. Hi folks, I live in the Caribbean, specifically the Dominican Republic. I'm going to share my first story here. One night back in early 2003, we had just moved into our new apartment. I will always remember that night for as long as I live. I was sitting on the balcony. We lived on the third floor. It was around 2.30 a.m. Eastern Time. The lights had gone out, but the night was quite clear, so to speak, since the moon which was behind me must have been either full or quite close to it. I was sitting on a chair facing north, when all of a sudden I saw this creature that flies by. I said, wow, this bat has got to be huge. The wings were pointy like the wings of a bat. It must have been around 250 to 300 meters from where I was standing. The wings moved graciously up and down, not like an actual bat. It was flying straight ahead, unlike a bat which flies, you know, erratically, so to speak. It lasted just a few seconds. I would say its height must have been similar to an average person's, and maybe it was around 25 to 30 feet off the ground. When I actually understood that what I was seeing was a gargoyle, I said, no way. No such thing exists. Boy, was I wrong. Such sightings are common in Puerto Rico and all over Central and South America. I remember when I was a kid in the 80s, such stories were pretty common in my country. People would tell tales about winged beings that would come down at night over rural and not so rural areas. Such beings would snatch infants away, but I never believed in such stories. My mom told me when I was 17 that one evening, when I was just a few months old, she heard the sound of some big wings flapping. There was this big tree in our backyard right outside my bedroom. Mom said she heard when the thing came down on the tree, and she already had heard stories of this back then, so she yelled at it. She was aware that it was there, and she was willing to kill the thing if needed in order to protect her child. That thing left and never came back as far as I know. But for as long as we lived in that house, I had no peace at night. I'm a realtor in Willow Springs, Missouri. That's part of the Ozark Mountains, and very near to Mark Twain National Forest. 
I don't know if that has any bearing on what I saw, mostly because I'm not even sure what it was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's what happened just last June. My office got a phone call from a woman whose grandmother had recently passed on. She had inherited her grandmother's house, which was barely within the town limits of Willow Springs. Even though I'd been living here for 28 years, I'd never been aware of the place. And this is a very small town, with only a couple thousand residents. It was that remote, set at the end of a dirt road that wound through the mountains. The client was living in California, and she told me she wanted to sell the house, but she wouldn't be able to come to Missouri. She said she hadn't been back here in many years, and had no idea what condition the house was in. She did say it was a very old house, built over a hundred years ago and might need some repairs before it was marketable. Basically, my first step would be to evaluate the property and let her know what I found. The lawyer's office dropped off a key, and I drove out to the house, almost getting lost along the way. It was set way back in the woods, and the driveway was unmarked, not even a mailbox. After passing it once, I backtracked and took a guess, turning down the driveway. It was only when I saw the house number on the front of the door that I knew I had found the place. It was in more of a state of disrepair than I expected. The client had told me her grandmother had lived out the last of her days here, but it looked like it had been abandoned for years. The roof was badly in need of repair, starting to cave in on one section. The paint was peeling and the steps were broken. There was a set of bulkhead doors on the side of the house secured with a rusted chain and padlock. I made a mental note to ask my client for the key. I carefully picked my way through the tall weeds to the steps, watching out for snakes. We have rattlers here, you know, and this looked like the perfect setting for them. I fit the key into the lock and opened the door, not quite knowing what to expect. I actually was pleasantly surprised. Although it smelled a bit musty inside, the interior didn't look too bad at all. You could tell my client's grandmother had cared for her home. There were crocheted doilies on the tables and TV stand, and simple but pretty curtains hung in the windows, probably hand sewn. The place was clean, no dirty dishes or trash. It was just dusty and needed airing out. I walked around inspecting the condition of the walls and the ceiling, trying to spot any issues that needed repair. Beyond the roof and exterior, it didn't look too bad. In the house, being quite large and set on three acres would no doubt bring in a pretty penny on the market. I figured I'd better take a peek in the basement, even though I was unable to open the bulkhead doors to air it out. A lot of these older homes have dirt basements, but I had come prepared wearing old sneakers. I found the cellar door in the kitchen, painted white with a black cast iron sliding latch on it. I slid the bolt, opened the door, and flipped on the light. The lights didn't work. I flipped the switch on and off again, but the bulb was obviously burnt out. For a minute I thought of skipping the basement until the next time I came, but I wanted to be able to provide the client with an accurate home value. I went back to the kitchen and rummaged through the drawers. Thankfully I found a flashlight. I shined the beam down the stairs. Yep, just as I expected, it was a dirt floor. The stairs looked okay though. I swung the beam around a bit, checking for broken boards. It was then that I noticed something concerning. There were scratch marks on the inside of the door. Claw marks like the kind a dog makes when they want to get in. I examined them in the light. They ran pretty deep. The door would have to be replaced. Filing that information away, I started down the steps, feeling bad for the old woman's dog, apparently locked in the cellar. I was careful going down, not knowing how long it had been since someone had used the stairs. I had to stop several times when I ran into cobwebs to wipe them off my face. I was getting a little creeped out, but then I was finally at the bottom. The only windows were tiny rectangular squares set high up. It was pretty damn dark. I tried to focus on looking for foundation issues, but I was starting to feel uneasy. You know how if you have your eyes closed, sometimes you can tell when somebody comes into a room, even if you don't hear their footsteps. Something about the way the air shifts like the space you're in seems smaller when you share the room with someone else. Maybe that sounds crazy, but as I moved further into the dark basement, shining my beam on those stone walls and dirt floor, I had a terrible certainty that something was down there with me. 
My heart started to pound and I started to panic, swinging my flashlight beam around erratically, trying to see what it was. I knew something was there. And then I saw it. It was crouched up on the rafters, a dark shape as big as a man. My flashlight beam caught the yellow reflection of its eyes. And then I saw a flash of teeth. I said, holy crap, and I stumbled back a step, but I was afraid to turn my back on it. It seemed to know that I had seen it. It shifted position, and I suddenly saw wings. Great, terrible, dark wings, unfolding from its body like it was preparing to come after me. I screamed and ran for the stairs. Unfortunately, I stumbled and dropped my light, but I was too afraid to go back for it. Thank God I didn't fall. I just careened on through the dark until I hit the staircase, and then scrambled up as fast as I could. I heard a noise behind me, and I was absolutely terrified knowing this thing was gaining on me. I took those stairs two at a time, praying I didn't trip again, and by the grace of God I made it to the top before it caught me. I barreled through the door and slammed it, bolting the latch and leaning back against it, trying to catch my breath, and that's when I heard it, scratching down low on the door, just like a dog that wants to be let out. I ran from the house without even locking it behind me. I jumped in my truck and took off. I drove like a madman out of the woods, wanting nothing more than to reach town. Whatever that creature was, I never wanted to see it again. I didn't take on the account. I called the client's lawyer and said I'd gone out there and the front door was wide open, so I decided not to go in in case there were vagrants inside. Then I told him after seeing how far out of town the property was, I had decided it wasn't a good fit for me. I mailed him back the key. The image of the property still haunts me, and sometimes I wonder, is that why the bulkhead doors were padlocked shut? As a police officer, I can tell you we get called out on some strange stuff, but when something really unexplainable happens, it usually gets brushed under the rug. The higher ups don't want us to get a reputation for being wackos, and I mean, I can understand that. But if more people were allowed to tell their stories, then all of this stuff could become less taboo. Anyway, it's nice to be able to tell a story about this here anonymously. I know that most of your listeners are less judgmental of the unknown. I've been on the force in one of the Salt Lake City suburbs for about 12 years. When this happened, me and my partner were working the night shift. We were called to investigate a suspected break-in at a morgue. When we arrived, the custodian was waiting for us out front. He told us that he had been mopping one of the corridors and he had seen something move in his peripheral vision. He said he looked up and saw a person sprint from one side of the hallway to the other. He wasn't able to give much of a description though. He said that he hadn't seen the person very clearly since they had flashed by so fast. It was just a dim outline, but it was enough for him to be sure that someone was in there. He had gotten freaked out and went outside to make the call to the station. My partner and I went into the building. We called out to anyone who might be inside, but we got no answer. So we began to do a sweep. We walked down the central corridor with our hands on our guns. We were going slow. We had to check every room on each side of the hallway. It was creeping me out a little bit, to be honest. I mean, I've been around plenty of dead bodies and stuff, but I didn't know what kind of individual we were chasing. Who breaks into a morgue? Every now and then we would call out for an intruder to show themselves. We were about halfway down the corridor when I got to a room with the light off. It was pitch black inside. I flipped a switch expecting to find the intruder hiding but it was just the waiting room for visiting relatives. Then I heard my partner call out, hey, stop, turn around. I got a big surge of adrenaline and swung back out into the corridor. I saw that my partner was pointing his gun towards something at the end of the hallway. He said, she went around that corner. The custodian was back by the door. When he realized which way she had gone, he yelled out, she's trapped, there aren't any exits that way. We were concerned that with the person being trapped, they might do something crazy. We had the custodian lock himself in the waiting room for safety. Then we started advancing down that hallway. We kept calling out to the woman to show herself. We made it clear that we weren't there to hurt her. I made it to the end of the hallway first. I had my back against the wall and I looked around the corner. I saw her. The woman was standing by a big gray door that was partially open. 
The lights were off in that area, so it was hard to see her clearly. But I could see she was holding a gun. She had long, blonde hair. I stepped out from behind the corner to begin approaching her. But she went through the door and disappeared into the room behind it, and closed the door behind her. I ran up to the door and pulled at the handle. She had locked it. I was banging on it and calling out to her, but there was no answer. The door had a deadlock on it. I yelled out to my partner to go get the custodian to unlock it. It seemed to take forever. Finally, the custodian came around the corner with my partner. When he saw which door it was, he just said, This door? Are you sure? I'm like, yeah, she went through there and locked it behind her. He said, that's the cold room. The door doesn't lock from the inside. I didn't know how to respond to that, but he found the right key and unlocked the door. I'm yelling, we're coming in, put your hands up. I had my gun ready and got inside the room. My partner was swinging his mag light to light up the corners. The custodian hit the light switch and the room lit up. It was empty except for some equipment against the wall and several gurneys in the middle of the room. All of the gurneys were empty except for one that was covered in a white sheet. The sheet was covering what appeared to be a body underneath it. I remember thinking how ludicrous this whole thing was. What a place to decide to hide yourself. I approached the gurney and it was the smell that made me pause. It smelled like a corpse. I had been around plenty of them. I finally pulled the sheet down and the woman was lying there. She had straggly blonde hair all around her face. There was no question in my mind that this was the woman I had seen by the door. I finally came to my senses enough to check the tag on her toe. It said she had died the day before. We just stared at each other in disbelief. I mean, what can you say? We had all seen her, and we couldn't all be crazy. You could tell how shaken the custodian was. He had been working there a long time and never seen anything like it. I swear it had to be a ghost. I'm writing to you today because I work for a temp agency, and I just left the strangest government job, and I need to tell somebody about this. Four months ago, I got a job working on a government project. On the first day of work, about 50 other temp workers and I walked into this huge empty warehouse. There were six men in suits sitting at a conference table with a projector aimed at the wall. We were told to gather around the conference table to have a meeting before getting to work. One of the guys in a suit stood up and he gave a speech saying from this day forth, we were heroes. We talked about the children's lives we would be saving by working hard and sending pallets of much needed food to the places in the world that needed them most. He went on and on about how every minute we waste is a children's life that could have been saved. He appeared to wipe a tear from his eye and left the room. I'm pretty sure that tear wasn't sincere, but it set the mood for the rest of the four months. We all worked like animals sending truckloads of pallets to the children in need. I worked as a forklift driver, and I didn't take a single break for the entirety of the time I worked. I would just take a quick lunch break, then I'd be back on the forklift and load pallets into the trucks to be sent off. The pay was pretty good for a temp job, but for a government job, it seemed to be absolute chaos. If OSHA inspected our warehouse, they would have shut it down in minutes. We didn't wear any protective gear, we didn't take any breaks, and we worked in a poorly ventilated warehouse without AC in the middle of August. We didn't receive any training whatsoever. No food or water was provided. I could go on and on. Every night after my 12-hour shift, I would be so exhausted that I had trouble making the drive home safely, but the pay was pretty good. About three weeks into the job, I got promoted to a management position. I was pumped because I got more pay, but I didn't know the first thing about how to manage an operation like that. The biggest perk was that they brought in an air conditioner trailer for me to do the paperwork in. The other workers looked at me with hate, but I couldn't complain. One day, a truck drove off the loading dock with a forklift driver still inside. The forklift fell off the back of the truck, and the pallet he was carrying crashed on top of him. I shut down the operation and checked on the forklift driver. He was in bad shape. He couldn't move because of the pain, and a bucket of chemicals that were in the pallet poured all over him, and his skin was burning. As we were trying to help get him out of there, all six of the suited men ran out to the parking lot. The one that did the presentation on the first day screamed at us for halting production. I explained to him that the forklift driver, we'll call him Peter, 
could have died and needs immediate medical attention. The suited man had a breakdown that I was undermining his orders and was selfishly putting my friend's needs ahead of the poor children's needs. I was speechless. He screamed at everyone to get back to work and they did. And everyone just ignored him and kept working. The suited men pulled out rubber gloves and picked up Peter and took him into my trailer. They locked the door and I didn't see them for the rest of the shift. We just closed one dock where the forklift was blocking accessibility and continued working feverishly. I had never been in management before when there was an on-site injury, so I did some research and learned the standard operating procedures to fill out an employee report injury form. Thinking I was doing the right thing, I filled out all the information, printed it out, and gave it to the suited man. The next day I went to my trailer and it was still locked. I knocked on the door and immediately one of the men pushed me back and closed the door to the trailer. I handed him the form and he immediately asked me how many copies I made. I just said the one and he asked which computer I used to make the form. I explained I used my home computer and he immediately took me to his car and had me give instructions to my address. We pulled up to my house and he followed me close behind. I went inside to grab my computer. He immediately grabbed my computer and threw it in his trunk. I started yelling at him and he gave me $2,000 in cash to get another one. My computer was only worth $300 so I took it. On the last day I walked in and the trailer was gone and the warehouse was almost empty. The only thing in there was a conference table and the suited men. I walked up to them and they handed me an envelope with my last paycheck in it. They said that the project was top secret and I couldn't talk about anything that had happened here. I agreed and I wished them the best. I walked outside and opened the envelope. There was a $20,000 bonus in there and a note that said silence. The temp agency has me working for a pest control company now, so things have settled down drastically in my life. I do often wonder what we were sending off by the truckload and whom we were sending them to. It wasn't food for children like we were told. It was some sort of deadly chemical and I don't know who was ordering so much of it. I also don't like the fact that those people know where I live.